But it's so difficult for poker players to accept the fact that they have this freedom, this privilege, and to embrace it and to use it. They have this obsession with productivity in a way that they have to get into these spots if they are there. And I don't really think it's connected to EV or money. It's more connected to that, almost that feeling of guilt of not doing something. Like not doing something feels off, feels guilty. It gets this minor underlying anxiety of I should be doing something, but I'm not. And I feel bad about that. Hi, it's Renchix. The following is my conversation with Coach Bachman. What are some of the common struggles poker players are facing and how to deal with those? How to get better at goal setting? How to get most out of the freedom poker affords you? How to find time for yourself? How to tweak your habits for best mental performance? How to deal with the fear of missing out? And, well, I could just keep going. The bottom line is, I'm sure there's something in this one for you. Timestamps are in the description and I'll share my key takeaways on my newsletter, so make sure to subscribe to it. And finally, to support the podcast, please subscribe on YouTube, like the video, rate the podcast on iTunes, and of course, share your favorite episodes with friends. And now, enjoy this conversation with Coach Bachman. And hence, I'm very excited to talk to you because, you know, your, your topic of work is really interesting to me on a personal level and uh, i've mm. had multiple conversations with people who work in the mindset and mental game uh, field and i always learn something new so I'm, I'm very excited about this this conversation awesome likewise yeah of course you know with that my experience of being a counselor for i think close to seven years, eight years before I went into my own business, high performance coaching and expanding into that world where I basically strictly only deal with high performance mental game professionals mm -hmm. or people in business, which I think are almost the same people, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that those, yeah, I think that that will be the main topic that I'm passionate about, intellectual giftedness uh, within that realm of high performance. Uh, I've done, you know, I've coached and counseled teens, uh, kids, adults who are also not highly intelligent, average intelligence, even kids, uh, kids in special education who were below average intelligence. So mm -hmm. I do have a broad scope of experiences. I started as an inner city youth worker on the streets. Um, you know, dealing with crime and drug dealing and stabbings and craziness and gang violence. So I've really did the groundwork. I think that's really what makes my perspective unique because I came from that environment as a kid, you know, dealing with petty crime and making bad decisions, growing up to become an example for these young kids. And then eventually growing into a world where you really don't hear a lot about stabbings and shootings and killings <laughs> right? in crypto or poker or business. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's rare. It happens, but it's rare. So the problems are different, but they're as valid. Right? They're as mm -hmm. valid as poverty or shelter or safety. Or, they're definitely as valid. And they they experience and people experience a, a different set of problems with, with the same intensity. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you actually start in that path, working with the youth hmm. as, as the counselor? How did this happen? Well, I was always, um, the interesting part of that is that a lot of coaches say, I was always the guy they went to to talk and they came to me and I talked to them and I was very, you know, I was like a therapist for everybody. I was not. Um, the reason for that was I was very isolated and very quiet and silent about my emotions. And that's because I didn't really know how to process my own emotions, let alone other people's emotions. So I didn't let people in. And I had a very clear set of boundaries when it came to that. So that was, you know, even more reason for me to be so surprised when I found my passion, because I absolutely did not expect to find it within coaching or helping other people. Mm -hmm. But after a couple of uh, failing startups where I lost a lot of money, I eventually went to school because of a lot of pressure of my fiance. Hey, you know what? Maybe just get a degree. You tried a lot of startups. You tried a lot of stuff. Maybe you're just the kid who needs to go to school. And I think I was 20 back then. And I said, you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe I am that guy who just 
need to go to school. Stop reading millionaire quotes on Instagram and stop, you know, being delusional and chase this high stakes poker dream or whatever dream I had back in the day. And I was, the problem with me was I was fairly successful in things that I did, reasonably successful, but never to my content. I was never happy with the success that I was achieving because I was chasing the wrong things. So when I was eventually 2021, I started event management, like hosting event as a study in Holland. Um, and really no interest specifically in events, just something that I picked up because I thought, you know what, I got to do something and really nothing is interesting me. So I went there and it was one time where my teacher told me, you need to find the internship. And obviously I was not looking for an internship. I left at the last minute, I was procrastinating. And they told me, you go to this youth center here in the old city where you grew up, you know the guys there, you just go there and, and do your internship. I already arranged it, you can start tomorrow. All right, whatever. If this gets me the degree, I'm fine. You know, I'll go. On. Who cares? So I went and I saw this guy who became my mentor and who coached me and guided me. I saw something in me that I never saw in myself before. And he told me almost from day one, you're going to be the new youth counselor here. I was like, get the hell out of here. I don't give a F about these kids or about counseling like you i want to make money bro my friend is in macau making money have eating expensive food and living a life i want to be there i'm not going to get there with youth counseling you know these guys there's no youth counseling playing 2k in allen <laughs> in vegas i want to get like i want money bro. i want like status and he told me no i'm i'm prom I, I promise you you're going to be that guy and eventually you know he was right i became a youth counselor because these kids were like a mirror to me and they almost forced me to open up and show a vulnerable side of myself if I wanted to connect with them. And I discovered there and in and, and, and that job that I value connecting with them more than my own ego. So I had to break down, so to speak. I had to open up. I had to show vulnerability to them. And in the process of simply just a guy showing vulnerability, opening up to them. Mm -hmm. I found out that I was helping them. I was like, how am I helping you? You are helping me. I'm opening up to you. How am I helping you? This is weird. And I noticed that coaching and counseling is, and that's the first taste that I had of that experience, that it's really a non-authoritative relationship. It's an equal relationship where we both grow simultaneously, maybe in different departments of life. Maybe I know certain things more than you do. Maybe you know things better than I do, but we both have our own qualities and we both can develop each other equally in our lives. And I think every good coach client relationship ends with the coach having grown just as much, sometimes even more than the client. Mm -hmm. And from there I discovered that I had a real deep connection with a highly intelligent kid that I was working with. He was obviously extremely intelligent. He had a very, very high uh, EQ as well. So he didn't really show the stereotypical problems like glasses, nerdy, skinny, asthma, <laughs> allergies. It was just a super strong, muscled kid getting in fights, beating people up, playing the guitar. He was getting girls. He was like, he was like this stereotype of, uh, you know, a, a jock, a handsome guy, popular. So he never really considered high intelligence because he always connected that with being a nerd. And that's what he, he was terrified of being a nerd. He just wanted to be a cool guy. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that in him so much that Almost that rejection against intellectual things, books, movies, being smart, studying for tests, trying your best at school. And I've noticed for him, after working with him a long time, that his rejection against intellectual activities was a fear of failure and not really his preference or his identity crisis. He was just super afraid of failing intellectual activities like studying or reading or understanding complicated concepts. And once we broke through that fear of failure together, me and him together, we really discovered this world of what is high intelligence and what kind of challenges come with it. And how do you discover high intelligence without being able to achieve a high score in an IQ test? Because me and him both were not able to do that. We are not academically 
inclined or good in making tests. We get huge fear of failure. We get blockades. We get blackouts. What, how our intelligence is wired is not optimized for making tests. And uh, we're really creative. We're social. We're sensitive. We have a huge EQ. We can scale up people pretty nicely. And I think this often goes for poker players as well. Poker players usually, most of them didn't really have a great academical career, but they're incredibly good at understanding complicated complex concepts and sizing on people, profiling people, getting a good idea of the vibe, the energy on the table, positioning themselves in the, in the optimal optimal positions. Sometimes they're incredibly talented in socializing within certain groups, but everybody else would call them an introvert. But then we talk to them within their social group, they're the guy, right? Because they just have this incredible sense of what they need to do in certain social settings and what decisions are optimal and how to position themselves. So a lot of things surface level became clear to me. Maybe yeah, maybe I'm highly intelligent. Maybe not by society standards, but what does it actually mean to be highly intelligent? And when I dove into that topic, I went to work for uh, Phoenix Talent in Utrecht, in a city in Holland, uh, founded by a renowned, world-renowned uh, TED speaker, um, Tal Kunderink, a guy who set up multiple schools all over the world, worked with a lot of famous, highly intelligent counselors. And I've had the pleasure of working alongside with the most brilliant minds in high intelligence. And from there, I decided, you know what? I think there's a who, huge group of people like me, 28 and up, 30 and up, who don't actually know they're highly intelligent, who maybe are too humble to admit it, or have this fear of failure when it comes to complicated intellectual concepts, or just never had tested. And they've always been told that they were not smart, they were average, or maybe they were stupid. Right? So they've internalized a lot of things that they've heard in their past. And I felt this group has to be bigger than just me. And that's specifically the group that I wanted to help. Wow, so many questions out of this, Please shoot. <laughs> this little story. First, let's circle back to the mentor. Because mm -hmm. after that, I want to dig deeper into your work specifically. But I found it very surprising that somebody could see the potential in you and tell mm. you, listen, you're going to be the counselor here. I promise you, even mm. though you showed, well, at least to yourself, you had no clue, no inclination. What mm. do you think that this mentor of yours, what did he see in you? Well, first of all, he had an incredibly positive, borderline naive outlook on life, which I've think is incredibly inspiring, which I I honestly copied from him. When I hear a story from a poker player no, or other client, no matter how dark their story is, I always find these sweet spots, this light in their story where they're like, what the hell are you talking about? My life is shit. I'm addicted. I'm tilting. I'm gambling. I'm losing in poker. I no longer have passion for poker. I lost my girlfriend. And somehow I still find light within that story. And that's what I think he found as well. And he really taught me this concept of, in Dutch, it's called omdenken. And there's maybe some Dutch guys watching this who know this. Um, but I think in English, it's best explained without translating it literally. Uh, it's basically use, using the, the idea of turning things around. He saw not a refugee kid in me, he saw a kid with experience. And he didn't saw a failed student, he saw a intellectual potential that did not fit the mold. And he didn't saw a guy who didn't care about anything, he saw a guy who didn't found something to care about yet. Mm -hmm. So he could find a way to turn things around in a positive way, almost, and this is what I have embodied myself as well, positive manipulation. He just took my thoughts and my ideas and my beliefs and my morals and manipulated me into finding a positive way of thinking about them and dealing with them, and implementing them in my life. Mm -hmm. And I always say coaches can be great politicians because that's a lot of times what we're doing with the person. They just have very negative outlooks on certain things and they believe things that are just not true many times. But our perspective of it 
is that true? Well, true. I mean, it's context, it's perspective. What is true? We don't know what true is, but I think it's oftentimes the most optimal outlook is the positive one. Right? And that's really what he saw within me. And I think that naive attitude also has challenges that come with it. I have those as well, but I prefer to, to deal with those challenges as they come than uh, look at things negatively. I'm a very positive person. And besides that, what, what I think he saw was someone who rejected the idea of counseling so much that he felt like there has to be something else to it. If I would have told a random guy, you're going to be a counselor, you'd be like, all right, that's weird. Why you say that? Mm -hmm. But I rejected it with so much passion. Like, no, what are you talking about? I got really angry. Like, So he's like, there has to be something there. It's interesting. And this is what I, you know, I've, I've learned from that as well with clients. For example, I have a poker player client. I had one of my first clients I had, I told him he should, try practice drawing doodling in his book and he rejected it with so much force and passion I was like that well, maybe there's something there that's interesting i mean if i talk to a regular person and ask him make a drawing they won't get angry they're like i don't know <laughs> but he really got angry you know like okay maybe there's something there and he saw that i really credit that to him that he saw that i passionately rejected something and i think there's always something there if you either passionately agree with something or passionately reject something, right? We're touching something that is part of your set of values and beliefs that you have. Hmm. Right. Because if you didn't care one way or another, then it's probably not so important. But if you, if you have a strong reaction, either positive or negative, clearly, clearly there's something to it. So what is intelligence? You've mentioned high intelligent multi multiple times i know it's a vague question but i think it's it a is. question i need to ask because mm. i believe everybody has their own idea of what intelligence is and from the story you described about this guy who you deem to be very highly intelligent yet he he was behaving very as the opposite right and mm. to himself he didn't consider himself intelligent because he had some sort of uh, an idea about how an intelligent person looks like yes. and it just wasn't him. So what is intelligence? How do we best define it? Um, what I'm really trying to do is redefine it actually, because I think we've been going at it too scientifically. I think intelligence is an experience of life. It's not a number of an IQ score. It's not your scores on your test. It's not how fast you can memorize things or how many books you read or how many things you can store. It's an experience of life, really. And that experience of life varies from person to person. But if we talk about just raw intelligence, I think it's uh, potential and capability to achieve a certain level of mastery in a topic that is aligned with your goals and values. An intelligent person can be terrible in playing an instrument and great in math, right? But then we have musical intelligence, who's an incredible musician, but terrible in math, right? Mike Tyson, I don't know if he's as smart as Albert Einstein, but he was an incredibly intelligent fighter. Just as all these MMA guys, if you're in the octagon fighting and having to anticipate so many different fighting styles under so much pressure. I don't think there's anybody in the world who would call these guys dumb, right? That would be very superficial. I think these are very intelligent. Probably dangerous fighters. as well. Y dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You don't call, you don't call a MMA professional <laughs> no, fighter dumb, especially to their face. No, it's, no, I wouldn't do that. That's a no, sign I'm, of low intelligence if you go and do that. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. But I think the stereotype would be skinny, nerdy guy who's good at math is intelligence. Boxer who beats up people is not intelligent. I think both are intelligent in their own ways. And both experience life very similarly. You'd be surprised how similar the experience of life of a golf player is to a professional MMA fighter because they both have something in common. Well, they have a lot of things in common, but I think the most tangible thing they have in common is the weight of their potential. That higher awareness that they have, which all intelligent people have, right? They just know, sense, feel, 
things more deeply than other people do. Therefore, they're more aware of all the things that are wrong in the world, like injustice. People are not integrity and disloyal. Those things bother intelligent people deeply. And they find their own personal ways to cope with that, right? Some people isolate from that and some people indulge in it and fight it and reject it. Just like I chose to either isolate myself or reject it or indulge in it. And there's different ways to cope with your potential. But many times I see people who the main similarity they have is that the weight of their potential is incredibly challenging because our environment sees something in us, right? They see that potential. That's where it comes from first. Our environment tells us this is a smart kid or this kid is showing potential. And now our teachers are telling us and now our friends are telling us and we internalize that and that develops into this crippling fear of failure for a lot of people. Right. And now fear of failure doesn't mean I'm afraid to do something. I mean, this people with tons of fear of failure who are performing in incredibly high level. Mike Tyson, as an example as well, he, he said many times in his podcast, right before fights, he was shitting his pants and puking and he wanted to get on the plane and get off and, you know, get away from the city. He didn't want to fight. He was terrified of losing. And this fear of failure was deeply ingrained. But once he hit that flow state, that's also a thing that's very common among highly intelligent people. They can shut everything off and go. Right? Full mm -hmm. speed, hit the gas. There's no stopping them there. They can even destroy themselves in flow state, which is a different topic, which I'm not a big fan of flow state, but we can touch on that later. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a couple of things that are very common among highly intelligent people that... Uh, flow state, deep, that's pretty much uh, uh, hyper-focus, right? Uh, managing their potential. Those are definitely two things. Higher awareness is one of them as well. Uh, most highly intelligent people deal with those things. And then, you know, we look at school, right? And we look at the most common ways of deciding intelligence. It's pretty old school, right? It's pretty... Uh, old way, traditional way of deciding intelligence, but we don't live in a world like that anymore, right? There's so many different avenues to be successful in life. I think in this new modern world, we should redefine intelligence because it's applicable to so many different parts of life, right? We can't call PewDiePie stupid. We can't call Phil Helmut stupid. We can't call professionals in their craft dumb people even if their IQ is below average, right? Then what's wrong here? Is it the IQ or is it the person, right? Is it the way we score them or is it actually how they are wired? I think we're gonna have to look at the way we score people more than we look at the people themselves. I think that's, uh, that's what's wrong there. Mm -hmm. I wanna take it in two directions. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we're going to have a big discussion about scoring, scoring people and scoring internally, like an internal scorecard, because mm -hmm. uh, that ties in with a lot of other things like fear of failure, fear of success in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, before we go into that one, I want to touch upon this weight of their potential that you've mentioned multiple times mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, highly intelligent people feel the weight of their potential. That implies that they find a niche, right? Pretty much. Because let's say that intelligent kid who was just running around and you know doing the gym or whatever and getting all the girls mm. without realizing that he actually is a super smart kid in, in, in many ways and could actually achieve something. If he doesn't set this weight of potential he doesn't have high expectations there's really no weight of uh of anything and and that's that's why a lot of intelligent people i i would assume um run away from these problems by just pretending that oh no you know i'm no good i'm not good mm -hmm. at math i'm not good at this this is not my cup of tea i'm not gonna do this and eventually you say no to enough things and your life is easy because there nobody expects anything of you, including yourself, and, uh, and you're not forced to do anything. 
so how do you think about this? Because it seems to me, especially thinking about the younger people, and you worked with the youth before, hmm. to figure out what you should be doing in your life. Well, first of all, good luck, right? Because it's it's a really tough uh, endeavor. And very often we are just led into specific fields because of our background, because of our friends, family, hobbies and interests, etc. And we just end up on some path without giving it too much thought. Most people choose their university even with just like, uh, that sounds like a nice topic. I'll go yeah. see what yeah. happens. How do you... So first of all, what do you think about all that? Do you help people figure out what is it that they're what is it that they have potential in and what is it that they're good at and what is it that should they should be doing really hmm. interesting uh the answer to that is no i don't help them figure out anything all of the answers they have are inside of them they're just blocking themselves from accessing them i in no way will be able to help a highly intelligent person who is maybe 40, 50 IQ points higher than me and richer than me and more successful than me find answers that I have for them. I think that's delusional. This person has their own answers. They're just holding the answers away from themselves, sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously. Right? And there comes that positive, manipul ma positive manipulation in again, because we're just trying to reframe beliefs, reframe thoughts, ideas, values in a more positive way. Right? Oftentimes, we're very inclined to just look at things from a negative perspective because that lowers our expectations and we won't get disappointed and we won't get hurt if we always expect the worst from ourselves and from other people. Mm -hmm. But once we set a certain expectations, now we have to reach it and now we're in a position to fail. That's scary. And everything that is connected to failing is scary. And that comes from childhood. When you have a young kid, just as you say, when they grow up, yeah, they're going to make the wrong decisions. Absolutely. A lot of them. And there's an interesting concept here that's called the theory of positive disintegration from Kazimir Dabrowski. It's a brilliant mind who, one of the guys in high intelligence, I this Bible, man, I got it right here, Living with Intensity, a Dutch translation. You can find his theory in that book. Um, he speaks about positive disintegration. Very controversial, very interesting guy, very uh, interesting life story as well, where he touches on the topic of a young kid, highly intelligent, initially does things for themselves, selfish, with no empathy, no regard for other people, right? Focusing on getting acknowledgement and love and attention from the parents and the people around them that they care about. And then they go to level two. And level two is the place where you mirror and compare your values to your social group, your peers. And you notice, okay, I have a decision to make here. Am I going to dumb myself down in order to fit in the social group? Or am I going to isolate myself? Very black and white, right? This is not this, you know, a lot of it is gray, but I'm talking black and white now. Mm -hmm. I isolate or I'm going to dumb myself down. I chose to dumb myself down. I didn't isolate myself and, you know, became a narcissistic asshole. I just chose for social and being a cool, likable guy. So in that decision, eventually we're going to have to deal with the consequences of our decision that we made. Mm -hmm. We're going to ask ourselves, who am I? Compared to these guys, who am I now? I have a sense that everybody has a good idea of who they are. I really don't know who I am. Or if we go the isolation route, did I did the right thing? Because I'm kind of lonely and depressed right now and don't have any friends. And I quit school at 16 because of my depression. So what do I do? Where am I? Where do I go? And these are questions that a young kid should not be dealing with because they're dealing with questions that they don't have the answers to. They don't have the life experience to answer them. But because of their higher awareness and their high sensitivity, which also is usually connected to high intelligence, they are feeling this process more deeply and more intensely. All right. And then we get beyond level uh, three. This is now the place where emotions start to build up or the build up emotions start to come up and we feel shame and guilt and embarrassment and anger. 
all kinds of dark shit towards our previous decisions and the person that we were. And we try sometimes try to run away from it, use drugs, use alcohol, just do something to process that feeling of inner conflict that we had with the person that we were. And here's the pivotal moment of the theory that Dabrowski talks about. We either recycle our problems until infinity, or we grow into the person that we truly are, the true authentic version of ourselves, with all the consequences that comes with it and all the fear and anxiety that comes with it. And that process right there, going from these dark emotions and shame and embarrassment towards the person that we want to be, that we know we truly are, that process is dirty, nasty, bloody. You can get diagnosed with bipolar, depression, addictions, personality disorders, OCD, a lot of diagnosis and a lot of a misdiagnosis as well, because the professional did not really take into account that this kid was highly intelligent. So they did not assume that this is a part of their personal development, which every highly intelligent person goes through. And now level five is Buddha, right? We just don't think about our values anymore. We just live our values. And people from a mile away can look at us and think, oh, that guy's he's standing for what he believes in. He's truly aligned with himself. He's present. He's comfortable. He has inner peace. And the interesting part is that Level one, the selfish part, right? The selfish part of our development where we just focus on ourselves and level five, where we become kind and empathetic, and loving and caring, and also think about adding to our friends and our social group and the world instead of just taking. Right? Those are both levels where we don't feel any inner conflict anymore. So where I try to get the client to is guide them through a place where they don't feel inner conflict anymore. And not because of selfishness and because they're hyper-focused on a goal, right? As poker players, sometimes we lock ourselves up in our underpants and grind all day and not give a fuck about anybody and then ignore our girlfriend, ignore our parents, just grind because, you know, we can justify it because we have a goal. Want to get the high stakes, want to get this amount of money or want to get this amount of freedom. We justify our bad decisions, our toxic toxic habits and toxic decisions mm -hmm. by saying, I got a goal. But now we want to get to that same place of inner peace and focus and dedication, but for the right reasons, right? Not because of selfishness, but of selflessness. And that's the process that I think I can help with. But the answers, you got to find them yourself. Mm. Can you tell me a bit more about your experience working with poker players, what are some of the common struggles that you see? Obsession, really. It's either obsession or it's nothing. When it comes to studying, when it comes to volume, all these decisions that they make, right? Even self-improvement and meditation, exercising, all these things that are... I think there's two main problems with that obsession. One is, is that it's focused on improving results within poker, which I don't think is the right move. We shouldn't do anything connected to poker just to improve our results. We should do it because we want to become better people, become, want to become a better version of ourselves, become more happy and more at peace with ourselves. And in that process, we'll become a better poker player with better results. But if we only hyper-focus on our results, then when our results are down for whatever reason, could be variance, could be a strategy, then we're going to feel like we're the failure, right? Instead of, it's just this little part of my life I'm not doing well in. But look at all these other parts. I'm losing weight. I'm building relationships. I'm having friends. I'm, I mean, you're, having, you're doing the podcast. If you would just right now value the quality of your life based on your poker performance and your volume, then maybe you would feel like I'm not doing that great, but you're also no, taking account. I'm doing good. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, beautiful. But, but I mean, but you, I think totally you have see, to take see your point. Yeah. Yeah. You have to take into account the podcast and the things that are happening here as a part of your journey to happiness, because that's the end game, right? The end game is happiness End game should not be productivity or feeling like we're busy all the time. So I think that's an issue with a, and the second issue is that this is what I see a lot with the obsessive behavior with poker players. Once they commit to either studying or volume or self-improvement, they basically, as a metaphor, go into the gym, pick up the heaviest 
weight there is, lift it one or two times, hurt the arm and go home. Like, fuck this. I can't, this is too heavy. I can't do this. Right. So to commit to a way too over ambitious study schedule, way too ambitious volume schedule, way too ambitious expectations when it comes to self-improvement. Right. When it comes to meditation, they want to reach the highest and deepest levels of meditation instantly. Or when it comes to journaling, they want to feel a huge difference in, in performance instantly. Right? It's, it's really difficult to... Um, and I think this goes with the high intelligence. We're talking about high stakes poker plays, obviously. right? Uh, their problems are, are different, really. There's a really different set of problems when it comes to the micro, low, mid stakes and when it comes to the actual high stakes players. And I think a lot of it has to do with intelligence, right? How high is your potential? How far can you go? You say the problems are, are different. What do you mean? I think many times when we deal with low micro players, we're dealing with the we can put it right next to the positive disintegration theory where once a person is still in the low micro mid stakes, they're very much focused in getting there. Mm -hmm. And first we got to talk about what is there. How do you define there? Like for a third world country, you are already there and beyond. Like what is there? What do you want? What, what have you even defined what there is? And they justify a lot of their behavior because they're not there yet, or they haven't got the bankroll yet, or they haven't had the opportunity to play at that stakes yet, or they feel like they're tilting when they get to that level. So there's a lot of self sabotage involved with breaking through that glass ceiling that they're experiencing. Now, when we talk with high stakes, actual high stakes poker players, most of them have defined some sort of getting there. Some of them already has experienced the getting there. And now we're talking more about passion, right? Where's the passion still? Where is it? Is there any passion? And if not, can we rekindle the passion within poker or do we have to find it in other areas of life? Or maybe you've lost passion overall on life, not just poker. Right? And this is where Dabrowski touches on as well with the recycling problems. We hear a lot about poker players. I think, in my opinion, the, the clients that I've worked with, and this is no, this is no, <laughs> no shot to poker players, but I think poker players are one of the uh, top losers in external activities when it comes to investments, crypto, or other things, borrowing money to friends, handing out money and helping other people start up things, backing and staking friends who you potentially might know they're losing. <laughs> and, and I truly think because this is just a magnet for highly intelligent, highly empathetic people. This field is a magnet for these people who are just so caring, so giving because of their sensitivities. They're easily swayed into making bad decisions based off of emotions outside of poker. And many times it can also come from I, I don't feel passion in poker anymore, so I'm going to find the passion somewhere else without doing the proper studying and, and analysis and, you know, the risks. And what am I even, I'm investing in this company, but I, do I really know anything about business, right? So I think that's our, you know, definitely issues that high stakes poker plays deal with that, you know, low and mid stakes I'm not yet worrying about. Let's talk about the low and mid stakes first and then yes. zoom in on the high stakes. Because what you said, I think it, you pinpointed the, the biggest problem that I see also with, with my work with uh, some of my students who are at the lower stakes and the mid stakes. Not knowing what exactly is there. The goal is too vague or the goal is outright... I don't want to say wrong because, well, goals are mm. personal, right? I might view it as wrong. Perhaps uh, the other person sees it completely differently. But it's easier for me to evaluate that goal because I've been there. For example, if somebody says, well, you know, I wouldn't play the highest stakes um, on poker stars. That's my goal. That's where I'm heading to. Oh, well, I've been there. I'm I'm still there, and uh, I tell you, it's it's not some sort of peak of the mountain where all of a sudden you get a, a little medal once you get there. 
the there is no difference no different money wise sure but you know if you identify with the money if you identify with the results like you said your life is going to be quite miserable if it correlates directly to your graph sure you're going to have nice days and you have going to have some miserable days but um, it's it's not it's not healthy mm -hmm. right so what is there how can people and I, I guess my, my question is more broad mm. because when we're setting a goal for ourselves, how can we evaluate that goal or how can we, how can we be better at setting the goal without actually knowing what does it mean to be there, which is pretty much with every goal. It's, you know, if you're heading somewhere, you probably haven't been there before. So you're you just have your own imagination when you get it. It's a bit like watching a movie after you read the book. It's not the same. It's the same story, but the characters are a bit different, right? Whereas when you read the book after watching the movie, well, the movie had a lot of influence on uh, how you're going to imagine the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Oof, that's it's tricky. It's tricky because setting goals is a skill in itself, right? And going back to the metaphor of going to the gym and picking up the heaviest weight and, you know, leaving because it's too heavy. Uh, many times when people commit to something, even the smallest thing, just the morning structure, right? You know, I want to wake up in the morning, do a couple of things. They don't understand how many skills they're actually tapping into that are very much underdeveloped, right? Discipline, self-control, uh, setting goals, commitment, uh, sacrificing. There's are so many different things that are tiny muscles that you just need to practice over and over and over again. So when we actually jump into goal setting and we try to immediately visualize this clear, direct, cut goal, we're going to get very disappointed very quickly because we attach too much value to it. And now when we don't achieve it, we feel like a failure, right? We want to get the... I'm a 25 and L grind. I want to get to 50 and L in two months. And I don't for whatever reason. And now I feel like a bad player. And now I'm internalizing this idea of me being a bad player and I'm self-sabotaging myself for what? Just this, you know, narrative that I've created for myself. And I think that's unnecessary. It's great if it goes well, obviously, but there's a lot of, there's a big price when it doesn't go well. So I think it's more uh, the, the main advice that I give to players who, you know, 10, 20, and I give a lot of, I mean, I give like 15 or 10, 30 minute free sessions. People just come to me for, you know, short talk. And I, I talk with everybody. I don't, you know, check if they got money first. I talk with everybody. I'm cool with that. So when a guy from 50 and L, 20 and L, 10 and L, 5 and L, last week, a guy on 2 and L talks to me. Uh, I always tell him, we need to focus on your attitude first. And there's a lot of information out there. How do professional poker players live their life? How do they behave? And what is the traits, so to speak, of a professional poker player? Are you actually practicing these traits or are you just putting in volume, volume, volume and hoping one day you'll hit the big time? Right? Because all of these traits are a part of the attitude that you need to develop to actually become a professional and treat this as a profession. In my opinion, this professional doesn't really have to be connected to your bankroll. If you treat poker as a profession and you dedicate yourself to it and you're able to make sacrifices and prioritize it in your life, which I think is also a main, main challenge, right? Actually prioritizing something. Then in my opinion, you're on the way of becoming a professional. But what is being a professional? We really need to get a clear idea of that. And I think a lot of people just don't have an idea of what it is to be a professional. But I have talked to 200, 400, 400, 800 grinders sitting behind a computer in the underpants. That's not professional. <laughs> I don't care if you make money. I know you make money, bro. A lot more money than me. I respect that. But you're not, you're not really being a professional. We got to be honest about that. Right? There's parts and aspects of your life in which you can be a professional or you can be complete sucker. And I think there's way more things than we can actually control on 5NL than the people realize. Right? 
but they're hyper focusing on that one thing with variance, right? The bankroll, but all the other stuff. I mean, you got a lot of control of how much you study, what you do when you wake up, what you go do to when you go to bed, whether you play or not, if you're in the right mental state, right? The people that you surround yourself with, toxic relationships that are pulling you down, all of these things, those are completely within your control. No variance there. Yeah. Mm. What do you think are the key traits of a professional? Mm, interesting. Curiosity, I think. Definitely curiosity. Uh, man, a huge heart gamble, willing to bet on yourself. Right? And I think with that comes a little bit being delusional. And going against pretty much every statistic in the world that tells you that this is not potentially the best market to find your job or make a living, right? I mean, we all know, I think it's, I think the odds are way better to become a professional soccer player than becoming a poker player. So it's, it's pretty tricky. It's pretty tricky mm -hmm. to find uh, a decent living in this world and not only find it, but maintain it, right? In, there's no four-year contracts that you sign if you have a good year, right? There's no eight-year Real Madrid contract that you sign if you potentially ship a World Cup or something lucky. This, Like you say, cash games especially, uh, there's no gold medals, there's no finish lines. You really have to create these, you know, almost uh, fictional moments of celebration for yourself. These narratives that you create for yourself and when am I going to decide to celebrate my achievement? Because nobody's going to do it for me. Mm -hmm. And even if you, for example, play tournaments, um, I coach a couple of clients in which I know would they have run better in certain spots, they would be among the top 10, top five in the world. But, you know, those are the spots that mainstream audience cares about. So they're not recognized like that. So is that what you value? It's tricky. Like, what do you value? I think it, it has to be a person that also has a a very clear set of values for themselves, who they are very, very committed to. Because man, this this is a world that can break you down, right? Eat you up, spit you out, and completely destroy you. Within the freedom that you have comes a lot of responsibility as well. You need a lot of direction, a lot of conviction in order to actually commit to it for a long period of time. So I think those are a couple of challenges um, and issues that I see. but. What, what the thing now, especially what I'm seeing is this new generation that's growing up without these opportunities of television and, you know, getting on ESPN and all these opportunities. I think there's also this new Twitch thing that's coming up and Twitter and people are finding, uh, basically cementing their position into the poker community in other ways. I think even more the creativity uh, and maybe even the EQ becomes uh, valuable, more valuable. Uh, mm -hmm. Getting yourself into good games, making people like you, appreciate you, being a high value individuals that people like to be around, whether you attract the online audience or can get yourself in a juicy Chinese game. I think both of them is the same skill set that uh, requires a lot of uh, social skills. Yeah, you're right. Now there's more and more opportunities for finding a path within poker because of the you know Twitch, what you've mentioned, for example, yeah. and uh, which kind of ties in with what you mentioned about freedom, because freedom is is risky. Freedom is tricky because sure you have the freedom. But that also means you have nobody standing over your shoulder, nobody giving you directions, nobody checking that, okay, let's see, did you work eight hours today? Did you study two hours today? There's nobody checking that. So you have to find the structures yourself. You have to find the motivation yourself. The processes need to be set by yourself. There's nobody else doing that. So what do you think are is the trickiest or are the trickiest things about having this abundant freedom and having no boss, having no obligation, having no customers, having no due dates, no deadlines, no nothing? Well, most of the time, professional poker players are much more nasty to themselves than any boss you can imagine. Their self-talk, negative, expectations are through the roof. 
the demand of themselves to perform over extreme long hours, not knowing how heavy and how intensive mental performance is and not knowing the impacts of that mental performance, not knowing how much emotional bleeding is what I call it is between poker and life where just a minor social interaction with a person that pissed you off can just push you one inch faster into that tilt. And now we have, you know, tilt on the table. And now that tilt on the table is going to push us one inch faster into that argument with our girlfriend. And it's constantly feeding each other. And it feels like when one thing in life is going wrong, everything is collapsing because of the lack of structure, right? We don't have anything else to fall back on. So just one minor thing feels off and now everything feels off. And combined with that high sensitivity, I think it's it's tricky. The snowball effect, super dangerous. And it's extremely difficult to break it if you don't have a feedback partner in that process. Whether it's your manager, your coworker or somebody, if you don't have that feedback mechanism in place, you know, the, the, the emergency break, so to speak, like, bro, you are spiraling out of control. And it doesn't even have to be drugs or alcohol or bad diet. It can just be hyper-focused tunnel vision in poker and not being able to stop and not being able to let your foot off the gas, not enjoying life, not taking a moment to just be with yourself. And what I also see with a lot of poker players, and if they watch this, they'll know I'm calling them out, that they spend time on everything except on themselves. Everything gets priority. Poker, podcast, interview, staking, backing, whatever everything gets in the schedule on the phone on the screen notifications everywhere but when do you have like a one hour two hour block scheduled for yourself just for yourself to do things that you enjoy not decompressing from a long poker week right not not disconnecting from poker because you you, you grind it too much no just for yourself i think those things come with freedom man and they're tricky and i think you can help a lot of it by, you know, getting a good group of friends around you, accountability friends, not only poker friends, but friends that you can feel safe enough to discuss emotional topics with. You can actually feel safe enough with your friends to tell, bro, I'm just feeling very negative and dark today. And I, I, I need someone to get me out of it. Can you, can you talk with me, please? That's the quality of friend that we need to be looking for if we have to deal with this madness of freedom all the time. And mm -hmm. especially now, this lockdown has been harsh for many life players. We're gonna have to deal with that online life, underpants grinder life for a while. Man, this is harsh. If you've been out grinding life tournaments and interacting with people and having dinner, and now you got to grind the, this life. This is this is rough. Online is rough, and I really think for online, the whole mindset concept. Uh, and I'm not gonna, you know, separate the two because you know, poker is poker. But I think the online audience. Uh, for them, they're definitely a risk group who are alone, uh, easy to get isolated, easy to get in your own thoughts, in your own head. You can ignore everything around you. You don't have to take things in. You can just be with yourself for months on end and nobody's going to notice or bother. And if you're not giving off any signals to anybody, then who knows that how it's actually going with you, how you're actually feeling. And then financially, everything could be doing great, but you're suffering. You're not enjoying, you're slipping into depression and all behind your computer while you're making a lot of money. So there's no signs, there's no signals to worry about you, basically. Mm. And again, that comes with that EQ, right? The social skills so is not only, and this is an intelligence type thing. I have a couple of videos and blogs on my YouTube and on my website where it talks about the intelligence types where you have interpersonal intelligence and intrapersonal intelligence, meaning the intelligence to understand other people and other people's relationships and have empathy towards them, but also the intelligence to understand yourself and know what you need in order to be happy and know how your body and emotions and mind are all working interrelated with each other and how it's all connected and how to get yourself back on a good mood once you're collapsing. I think those things are uh, much more applicable to online guys. Mm. So many questions about what you just uh, said, and I agree with everything you said. It definitely pointed out some of the key issues uh, that I 
also see are the key issues. Let's zoom in on the expectations first, because that came up uh, several times. Poker players had uh, set expectations too high for whatever we do, whether it's, okay, I'm going to go into meditation. All right. Expectations, two hours a day, consistent, starting now. Right. And, and things like that. So yes. what is it with setting expectations? Why do poker players, why, why are we more prone to just go way too high and commit ourselves way too much? Because we actually have the potential. We have the capability to do so. And we're aware of that. And it's true, but it needs practice. Right? Potential without practice is nothing. It's just pure frustration. So we do need to practice, even though we have the potential and we will probably get there. And you know what? I think most of the time when people set expectations, especially highly intelligent poker players, they most of the time even go beyond their expectations. I mean, as an example, did you think you would get where you got in the beginning when you were starting poker? Mm, not at all. To be honest, I never had any expectations for poker. I got into it because I enjoyed it and it was a go. journey. And uh, since I don't play tournaments, I think for tournament players, it's a bit different because you have yeah. a specific trophy in mind. Yes. If you if you don't, then why are you playing tournaments, right? And yeah. I never had a trophy in mind. So that's why I never it never appealed to me. Um, but in cash games, no, I never had... A specific aspiration so you know when the day came when you you just realized that oh you know what i've been just playing whatever the highest stakes were running at the time yeah. for the last few months and i well i guess i'm a high stakes player now right it, <laughs> that's pretty that, cool <laughs> that's how it happened yeah but um yeah, yeah so See, kind of i never expected right? to get there but yeah. at the same time i didn't have other expectations so it's not like i go. overshot them right no but that's beautiful, right? That's amazing that you didn't even have to set expectations to even go beyond your expectations. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's pretty overrated to even expect something of ourselves and just have a good strategy and commit to that seems to be the optimal way to go about becoming good at anything, right? Having a strategy, knowing what you're going to do day to day, week to week. That's it. We don't have to really look beyond that, right? mm -hmm. especially not if we're picking up something for the first time, whatever it is. And I think the expectations thing is most of the time internalized because of the high sensitivity at a young age, right? And that doesn't have to be a major childhood trauma. And I, this is what I really want to overstate when I talk about high sensitivity in young age. I have a client who, for example, had a, 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 a weird weird thing that they connected asking questions with stupidity and weakness. So they always expected to know things. And if they ask questions, they're stupid. They're dumb. You shouldn't ask questions. You should know things. And retracing it back in many conversations, eventually finding that one spot in his life where a teacher once told him, you should really stop asking questions. You're asking too many questions. That one moment just stuck with him for the rest of his life and never went away and left such a deep impact that he forever connected asking questions with stupidity. Shouldn't do that. It's dumb. You should just know things. So now we have this kid deeply traumatized, unknowing of the trauma that he experienced later on in life, has internalized that completely and has made it a part of his personality. And from there, we need to slowly, again, practice creating a different reference for asking questions. What does it mean to ask questions? Does it stand for stupidity or does it stand for curiosity and intelligence? All right, so very slowly. If we would have set expectations with, for that immediately, then you know, you're going to set yourself up and you're creating this narrative and a structure that, I mean... Has it ever helped in anything? If we just go through our own life, has it ever helped us perform? Uh, I think there's a difference, right? The positive, there's a thing called positive perfectionism and negative perfectionism where positive perfectionism is mostly internal 
I want better for myself and negative perfectionism is mostly I want better because of these per, these people or this degree or this money mm-hmm. or this achievement. And I think both have their challenges. I don't think the positive perfectionism is actually completely 100% positive because we can be our own worst enemy as well. And we can internalize other people's voices and opinions of us. And it just seems like we're doing the talking, but we're not. And sometimes when we have that self-talk, we need to try and recognize maybe it's not me, right? Maybe I'm just repeating something that I've heard before. Mm-hmm. You know, there's multiple things I want to go into that. And we're like branching out from the branches. And eventually, we, I hope we're going to circle back because I have still so many questions I wanted to ask before, from the previous discussions we had. But um, actually, before we get into any questions, you asked me about my expectations, whether I reached them or overshot them or whatever. And I realized when I described to you that I, ne- I didn't have specific aspirations to reach a specific stake or something. I realized that I did have expectations which developed over the years. Obviously, I've been playing poker for whatever, 13 years now or probably even more. At some point, I guess I developed expectations in regard of poker becoming a healthy part of my life. Right, that that was my expectation that I can actually have. Well, it's called a happy life, which is not not a great definition of what I exactly am trying to explain. But a life where poker is a part, and just a part, mm. a part that I enjoy, a part at which I um, can express myself and where I can grow, et cetera, et cetera, but it's just a part so that it's not an overwhelming obsession with just the one thing that matters and nothing else matters, right? Mm-hmm. So I feel like I achieved that point at, at you know some quite a few years ago now, and hence that progression to yet higher and higher stakes, that happened just naturally as a function mm-hmm. of just doing what I set out to do having poker and my routines and uh, routines for study and playing in such a way that I don't burn out. Cause I mm-hmm. did have a lot of experiences in my, especially early years of career of complete burnout of complete obsession of uh, unnecessary. And I can't stress enough just how unnecessary those 14, 16, 24 hour sessions were mm-hmm. at some point. I think I played that was in a live game. 32 hour session or something ridiculous mm-hmm. like that. I was actually proud of it. I was like, yeah, I did it. Why? What yeah. was the point? Like, yeah, what, what was, was the, the point, point really? Right. Because to be honest, okay, that session was good, but then I have to sleep for like two days. Yes. Right. And I mess up all sorts of things with my health. And what are the costs of that? Was, was that extra profit really healthy if down the line in a couple of years time i actually have to spend it on medical bills right Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely good point and i love that you stayed sorry i love that you state i want to have an expectation that is within my sphere of control right because Mm -hmm. you really can't control how fast you get to a certain stake or how fast you get to an x amount on your bankroll but you can definitely control if you are making poker a healthy part of your life. That's right. completely within your control. And I think that's super important. And that's what I've been trying to do as well the last couple of years. You know, ever since I started my company, I went through the same roller coaster as everybody goes through, even me as a coach, right? <coughs> Sorry. Burnout, obsession, work too hard, commit too much, sacrifice too much. And eventually getting to a place where, okay, now I'm happy, I'm healthy. That's what we want to want. Mm. Read some books and study my notes, etc. cetera. Mm. There, you know, that's where I have my expectations. Read X amount of books, take notes, practice it every day, help X amount of people. You mentioned mental performance and how mm. a lot of people in poker underestimate just how taxing it is. Right, we're so used to playing with a high focus, 
for 20, 12 hours in a day nonstop and just considering that it's normal without actually realizing just how taxing it is, how much energy, both mental and physical, we consume to do this, especially to do this on a, on a daily basis. What do you think, what, what advice would you have for people in this regard? Or maybe can you illustrate a bit more about, because really a lot of people just don't realize just how taxing it is. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's, let's try to explain from what you know. Sure. What does, uh, let's my... say, what does a 12-hour <clears throat> poker session mean in terms of what it, what mm -hmm. it does to you? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, we're going to talk about mental and physical, right? We're mm -hmm. exhausting ourselves, our brain, and we're exhausting our body. Sometimes we're using some uh, stimulants, uh, mix it up with some caffeine or some other stuff that helps us stay awake for longer periods. And we're basically putting our body into a high stress performance. So we're just running on stress as a fuel, which we all know is um, not really healthy in pretty much every disease that you can imagine can come from high stress. And most of all, I think the emotional roller coaster that comes with it is, man, very underrated, right? We know about bad beats. We know about upswings and downswings, but even without upswings and even without extreme downswings, we are going through an emotional roller coaster of performance while we're constantly saying no to every single distraction in our life. That's already a huge task, right? Our mm -hmm. phone is right here. Our browser is right there. We got some things that we know are probably pinging us or messaging us, some money or things that we loaned out. All of these things, we're not only saying yes to poker, we're saying no to 20 other things consistently over X amount of hours, which it, it's hard, right? To, to even commit to being so disciplined for such a long period of time is incredibly tricky. And now what happens with mental performance many times is that after the performance, all of a sudden, and I think this is somewhere, <clears throat> this is described pretty well in uh, Dr. Dispenza's book uh, about um, becoming supernatural, I think. I'm not sure, but uh, some of you guys in the comment might <laughs> rectify me on that, where he talks about your brain having a discipline muscle. And that part of your brain, the cognitive part of your brain has a discipline muscle. And every time you say no to something, you practice that muscle and it becomes easier to say no. But you can also exhaust your muscle, meaning I would say that's a perfect explanation for why poker players after such a long session or such a long week, they become very sensitive to their bad habits that they have, right? Whether it's eating poorly, smoking, drinking, staying up late. Uh, procrastination, all of these things, most of the time that behavior shows up in the evening, right? In the morning, usually you want to get at it. You're okay. Some of them have a bad morning structure, but most of people, you know, in the morning they can get started. They start the session. They're pretty hyped. They're energetic. They're focused. And then the longer that session takes at the end of that session, most likely if you overextended yourself, I would say over four hours, two to four hours is a good spot there. Some people would have to stick the two hours, Optimally, there's some research done that after two hours, your focus decreases pretty hard. Uh, but, you know, two to four hours is realistic. After that, if we go to eight, 12, 14, 16, we see a huge increase on bad habits in the evenings. At least in my research with all people that I've spoken to, all of those habits show their face in the evening after a session. And I think it's just exhaustion, most of it. A lot of bad habits just come from being tired of saying no, right? And not being able to fight that urge when you're just knocked out of all the tough decision-making that you've been doing. Hmm. What would be your advice to people in this regard? How do you think it's best to structure your day? And obviously that's quite individual and personal because people some people are naturally more productive in the morning some people are naturally more productive in in the evening we have different capacity for uh enduring all sorts of things but is there a general guideline that you think would be healthy for people to observe yes uh it really comes down to embracing your freedom 
a lot of times I see poker players and that, you know, tournament plays is tricky, right? You have long sessions, tournaments take seven, six, eight, ten, 10, 12 hours as long. It's very tricky to get a good structure when you're playing tournaments. And I understand that. And I recognize that a lot. It's a challenge that is just very tricky. So for tournament players, I also try to explain the embrace your freedom concept goes for go at least a couple of weeks without tournaments in certain periods of time in your life because you need to disconnect from the emotional roller coaster but also the hormonal roller coaster that comes with poker and in cash game i would say embrace that freedom even more because you can quit after two hours maybe four hours and if you can you should but it's so difficult for poker players to accept the fact that they have this freedom this privilege and to embrace it and to use it they have this obsession with productivity in a way that they have to get into these spots if they are there and i don't really think it's connected to ev or money it's more connected to that almost that feeling of guilt of not doing something like not doing something feels off feels guilty it gets some minor underlying anxiety of i should be doing something but i'm not Mm -hmm. and i feel bad about that should i just go play poker i guess if i do that i feel better so let's just okay let's just play poker instead of being with myself with my thoughts with my demons with the things that i'm experiencing now that need time to process that actually need breaks away from the game to give a give yourself an honest chance to deal with those things and instead of distracting because poker is the perfect distraction it's the perfect escapism right i'm not saying there's a lot of people addicted to poker they are probably but i wouldn't say the professionals are addicted to poker but it's an escapism it's a way to get away from some nasty stuff that you don't want to deal with and in a way it also makes you feel productive and good about yourself so it's an easy trap to fall into i think And I would recommend just practically uh, minimize on performance boosting stuff, caffeine, sugars, all craziness that people use to up their energy level because you're basically just enhancing the roller coaster effect. You're really not boosting anything. You're just giving yourself more stress. And stress, I mean, we have enough of that when we're performing. So do we really need more stress on top of that? And I'm a, yeah, I'm a big fan of minimizing caffeine and sugar as much as possible. And diet is huge as well, super underrated. Eating well is such a huge edge on your opponents. You have no idea. If you eat well, I mean, compared to the people on your table, I would bet a lot of money that half of that table is not eating optimally. So if you eat well, man, that's a huge, that's a huge step forward. And exercising, major Major, major exercise. Yeah, major key as well there. Exercising is huge. Just for your, uh, especially for people who sit on the chair all day, like posture, getting some testosterone, some extra confidence. Yeah, there's a there's a pretty, pretty big, especially for stress reliefs, some good hormones, endorphins. Yeah. Well, we're definitely going to dig deeper into that. Um, first, let's get back to... what you described almost as a fear of missing out in a way when why people especially the high stakes i've I've been there myself with this feeling and i know a lot of my friends are still occasionally experiencing the same thing of i can't take time off because the games are going to dry out at Mm -hmm. some point i mean i had the first time i thought the game's going to dry out that was 10 years ago yeah, right. so they're still here. In case, still here. in case you guys wondering, the games are still here. But for are gonna still like ten be years ago, I started out. stressing out and freaking out about, oh no, I can't, can't go out today. I can't take a day off today. I can't take this vacation for two, two weeks. And if I do, I better bring my laptop with me because I better grind. Because guess what? The games are drying out. And the higher you go in the stakes, the more important I think is to find that or allow yourself to take that time mm. off. Because really that just becomes, you need to allow yourself because you can afford it. Like the mm-hmm. world's not gonna stop spinning if you take you know, even two months off or something. And that's something that I, I remember from our conversation with Fedor Holtz, uh, he hugely attributed his escapes on like 
two months, three months away from everything, yes. really, yes. as he hugely attributed them to his success because those periods allowed him to refocus, allowed him to understand better what's important for him, how does he want to approach it, mm-hmm. and then he can dive into it with a renewed passion mm-hmm. as opposed to just burning yourself out perhaps even gradually over a long yeah. period of time where you're just not giving this, uh, yourself an opportunity to just step away from the games and say, you know what? It's fine. I don't, I know this is a beautiful game and it's not gonna, you know, this specific recreational player is probably not going to be around for too long, but it's fine. I need fine. to to put myself first. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that, you know, you should adhere to some, strict schedules of like oh no i i'm finishing my my grind at 4 p.m today sure give yourself you know when you are at the high stakes you have to be flexible in terms sure. of you know sometimes you can wait for a game for two months and there's nothing and then there's a mm. two-week period but be be ready for it uh, i i would assume i agree this is yeah. also one of the reasons why a lot of the high stakes players they don't play the lower stakes let's say they don't jump into 2k plo games Mm. and uh, a lot of people might think oh it's just because like it's money is not significant but no the hourly is still there you don't want to be tired Mm -mm. or exhausted for the moment when it actually is game time and when you need to perform exactly yeah so priorities, right? Those priorities, saying no to things is powerful. Being able to say no, right? and that really comes with, again, embracing your freedom, coming at it from this abundance mindset where you'll be fine if this opportunity goes away and you don't take advantage. Mm. You'll be fine. There'll be a hundred other opportunities. And if there will never be any other opportunity in poker and poker dies, you'll still be fine. You're smart. You're very creative. You can come up with ways to make a living. You're not an idiot. You've learned things, right? So I think that really comes with loving yourself and valuing yourself on a very high level that you're just always going to be fine. You're always going to be fine regardless. This opportunity does not make or break you. And you can let this one go and you can let the next 10 ones go as well. It's fine. You're going to make it. You're going to be fine. You're going to be great. You're going to be happy. But we need to recognize our other blessings as well, right? It's easy, especially if um, for highly sensitive people, they'll all recognize this very much. If one minor thing in their life is off, everything collapses. Just one minor thing, one tiny habit or one, you know, one thing that bothered you during the poker session or one thing in a social interaction, if that felt off, everything all of a sudden feels off and you feel like, man, I got to get back on track. I'm collapsing. This is what's happening. And then that's, <clears throat> there's this concept, right? Uh, hyper brain, hyper body, which talks about this when the brain is hyper, so to speak, the body is hyper as well. So this is really interconnected that you can even physically feel off because of your brain and your mindset being off. Mm. Interesting. Let's let's get back to the topic, and it relates to what we just discussed. Uh, you you've mentioned, or well, you described a situation where everything takes priority for you know a highly efficient professional poker player who prioritizes everything and you know session. All the other, like the calendar, it looks like a Christmas tree and everything is planned out perfectly. But the question is, when do you find time for yourself? And I I really resonate with this and I still struggle to this day occasionally to just, you know, after two, three, four weeks of madness, you look back at your past month and you say, well, what the hell? Because when did I have time for myself? There's all the all the demands and all the responsibilities and people pinging you with this and that and that. And occasionally, sometimes, you know, if, if it's only somebody requires five minutes of your attention, but it's like 80 people, mm-hmm. that's a lot of minutes, right? And, and it's never five minutes because you think it's going to be five minutes. It's not five minutes, mm-hmm. right? And with everything else. So how should people find... 
Because it's not really about finding the time for yourself. It's making yourself a priority or Mm -hmm. having the time for yourself a priority. How do you think about that? Do you have any tips on on this topic? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different strategies that you can use for a couple of different social groups in your life. I think the social pressure is immense, especially when it comes to close friends and family in your life, whether they need advice, money or something else. That pressure is just huge, right? You don't want to come off as arrogant or unsympathetic towards them. So I think in that aspect, we really have to make people around us that we value a co-owner of the process that we're trying to achieve. Right? Mm-hmm. We need to take them with us in that process and be as open and vulnerable as possible to them, as I do with my fiance, that I sometimes tell her, if you say to me, let's watch this Eddie Murphy movie on Netflix, I will most likely say yes. And most likely I am procrastinating my work that I need to do. So I would like you to help me in this process of getting my priorities right and ticking off my to-do list before I engage in these things with you. I make her a co-owner because it's also kind of her responsibility because I am available, as I see with so many poker players, they are almost over available to their environment, always active, always ready, always ready to chat, help back financially, whatever. They're always ready and and, and open to their environment, but they also need to share that responsibility with their environment that they truly care about. Now, if you're talking about outside of that circle, business and all that stuff, then it gets a little bit trickier because you don't want to open up like that to those people, but you still want to give boundaries, but you also don't want to burn any bridges. So I think we really have to just old school start structuring our days and locking in hours for ourselves, like locking it in, non-negotiable. And I really, I mean, for for high stakes players, the best things I did for my life ever was getting an assistant. He's changed my life tremendously. I told him, lock in these hours for me and my fiance in the evening and in the morning. The rest of the day, just whatever, do with it, whatever you want. But those hours, lock it in, non-negotiable. And I think that really tremendously helped me. It's incredible, like life changer. And the reason I can commit to that is because I do have availability for the people around me, but it's just limited to a certain amount of hours a day. So I am there, I am available, I am caring, I am kind, I'm open to people. I don't want to come off as an asshole, but I'm limiting it to a certain amount of time an hour uh, a day. And I think the easiest is mornings and evenings, morning routine and evening routine, because right at that time, it's a great time to disconnect, put the phone away, put the screens away, read a little something, grab an instrument, learn something, maybe pick up a hobby that you've left many years ago because of poker. Poker got overwhelming and obsessive and you left a couple of cool hobbies that you had. Maybe pick those up. I started rapping again. I don't, you know, put out tracks, but I used to love writing raps and recording raps. And I've picked that up a couple of years ago and I've, you know, loved writing, just being with myself and write a couple of things on paper and, you know, do something that has no financial benefit whatsoever, but just helps me unwind. So I think the mornings and evenings are great moments to just put in an hour, 30 minutes of non-negotiable time for yourself, where you kind of have to stick to a couple of rules, right? No financial benefit. Hopefully it can be creative because I would say creative is a good guideline to stick to it. Um, and something that you just enjoy to do, right? That's it. Yeah, blocking blocking the time for yourself, definitely. Definitely a big one, especially once it's non-negotiable and it's recurring so that you know that mm, it's, let's make a simple example. It's Wednesday and it's before noon. Uh, that's my time. That's mm-hmm. what I do, whatever it is. And obviously, it's it's best to structure a specific task, like a specific hobby or a specific thing that you enjoy. Otherwise, if it's open-ended, we're way mm-hmm. too likely to just slip into, well, I'm just going to check the lobby anyway. Mm-hmm. Right? And then, well, we all, all know what happens when you check the lobby. <laughs> Even if it's empty, <laughs> you're going to find one way or another to convince yourself to... Stick around. Yeah, you go find a big wheel. Yeah. 
you mentioned diet. Uh, what are some of your tips related to using your diet to improve your mental performance? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a professional in that aspect. But what I do uh, have personal experience and, and hundreds of clients that I've helped with is a food journal is a game changer. Really writing down everything you eat on a day. I truly believe that every healthy, well-thinking person can decide for themselves what is healthy and what is not, and what is a balanced diet and what is not. As long as we don't go into extremes, I think everything is fine if we don't eat too much processed garbage, but we all just have to become more aware of what we eat. We don't have to specifically zoom in on fasting or zoom in on carbs or zoom in on meat because that, in my opinion, is also a little bit of hyper-focus, escapism of not being able to zoom out and see the bigger picture. Right? As I see with a lot of poker players, once they you know, get into a very tricky river spot, which happens maybe once in, uh, in every two years, and they're just over-studying this stupid river spot for two weeks, like, bro, this is not going to happen <laughs> anytime mm -hmm. soon. Just zoom out and spend time on your overall strategy. That's where you probably can win way more you know, than just zooming in on this one specific spot. And I think that happens with diet as well. A lot of poker players, big fans of fasting or keto or vegan. And I think that's all great. But how is your overall food strategy? If it's garbage, then fasting, you know, it's not really going to do anything for you. You might lose a lot of weight in like two days and then you're going to gain it all back because you eat trash all the time. So I think a food journal is a game changer. Write everything down that you eat. You're going to notice immediately that you're going to eat more aware and be more aware of what you put in your body because you actually have to write it down and feel like a pig, which is good. And write like two guys writing a whole book here. I'm like, bro, what the hell are you putting in? <laughs> yeah, how are you not fat? <laughs> like some guys, man, they eat so much and they're skinny. <laughs> but it's good if you write it down, then you already have some more awareness. And next to that, when we start to write down, I think it's good to treat it as you know, with a little bit of respect. It is a profession. Nutritionist, putting food in your system is a profession. So spend a little bit of time and investigate you know, some stuff around it. Read a book about it, right? Treat everything with the same curiosity that you treat poker. Why not read a book about diet? Why not read into the back of the thing in the bottle of water. Okay, how many calories is in there? Okay, this is silly, but whatever, just something. How many is in there? How much fat am I eating? How much sugar am I eating? How much calories am I eating? All these things, I think curiosity is the best tool for those, right? Just be curious, be, be always questioning your decisions, right? Not with anxiety, not with stress, but just objectively question your decisions that you make throughout the day. I think that's really what makes a professional. Uh, and I'm really against all kinds of performance enhancing stuff like caffeine and stuff that's really, that really bugs me like coffee and stuff. And I think most coffee drinkers would admit that it's not optimal, right? It's not optimal. But uh, we're definitely going to discuss that with you <laughs> very soon <laughs> because I am a coffee drinker. I Good. don't yeah. necessarily identify as a coffee drinker. If somebody would ask me, like, uh, so what are you? That that's not on the list of of the things I would mention. But I do drink coffee uh, regularly, and I enjoy coffee. Sure, well, so I love gonna, it too. We're, we're gonna we're gonna get back to that. But first, you mentioned the food journal. And I know that, let's say, a poker journal of sorts is also a great tool for being more aware of your behavior of why, why exactly did you sit down and play 12 hours with no break? Mm. Why did you play on the day when you were not supposed to play? Why did you check the lobby, right? Because once again, form of escapism, because poker... For people outside the industry, it seems like, oh, it's a stressful place. There's so much variance. You're going to like ups and downs and roller coasters. For a mm -hmm. poker player, once you're numb, numb to those experiences, it's a safe place. I'm in my environment. I know what I'm doing. I am comfortable in that environment. Uh, same as probably with surfers. They are in a safe place in their waves. But from the outside looking in, you're like, Jesus, they're in a washing machine kind of experience. I, mm. I think they're they're in trouble, right? What's your experience with 
if you have uh, suggested your your um, students to use a journal, if you have uh, or just thinking about it, what do you think are some of the ways to improve your awareness about what what you're doing and how you approach your day? Mm. Well, there's different uh, styles of using a journal, right? There's the superficial style of just writing down things that has happened, very practical, very uh, surface level. But there's also a way of digging a little bit deeper into your emotions that are connected to it, your feelings, uh, your sensations, your physical and mental experience of the whole situation or decisions that you've made and the aftermath of these decisions. And can you maybe connect them to childhood where you as a kid also shown some similar behavior uh, in the past and now still are showing that similar behavior, right? Can you maybe recognize that inner child here and there where you're uh, behaving almost like a child in certain situations, right? Reacting like a child in certain situations. So I think there's two different levels that you can go to, which I think both are fine. If you are not comfortable, you know, jumping into the emotional level, then that's fine. You get there. I think there's a lot of value to get there, but I think there's also value in just the surface level journaling. Uh, and I think most of it, of course, is awareness. Obviously, you know, we, we just need to, um, we really need to become more conscious of the hundreds of decisions that we make throughout the day, thousands of decisions that we make throughout the day. And if, you know, if we don't know it, uh, we're not aware of it, we can't change it. So that's, I think, part of it. And another part of it, I think, is super interesting when it comes to poker players, is that I think the most, the most, uh, uh, we'll talk about just a huge, uh, ceiling that some poker players have to break through in order to truly get to that next level right is that when you've tilted and when you've made some embarrassing decisions are you able to emotionally withstand studying these spots or are you the type who just deletes all the hands out of holder manager <laughs> like what kind of type of player are you right are you actually reviewing those embarrassing painful moments or are you just letting them be and putting them in the in the tilt folder and like okay that was tilt right i was tilt. i don't have to study that that was tilt. i think that's interesting when it comes to journaling as well because now we're going to have to review certain super embarrassing weird strange unexplainable decisions that we made but those are the most valuable because in our heightened emotion state we can learn so much about who we are who we truly are right instinctively instead of this person that we perceive ourselves to be, right? In control, smart-ish, you know, pretty disciplined. But what are we when we are angry as hell or sad or jealous or envious, right? Who are we then and how do we behave? And I think with poker, I see a lot of mid, low stakes players, huge tilt session, just throw it out, put it in a tilt folder. That didn't happen. Let's just start tomorrow fresh, right? And let's not think about it. And I think this... Uh, of course happens with some high stakes plays as well. But I think high stakes players have a better objective view of their game and can disconnect their personal opinion about themselves and poker a little bit better. And, you know, I, I think it also has to do, at least in some cases, perhaps in the majority of cases, it's a problem of identity in a way. Mm -hmm. Because when you're looking at a tilt session and dismiss it, it's sort of a mechanism to protect yourself mm -hmm. because it's a question of how you look at it. You either look at it, I made a mistake yes. or I played bad, kind of the same thing, or I am bad. Mm. And if you identify that, oh, you know what? This was just bad. I'm, I'm bad. I don't want to look at that. I don't want to look in the mirror and, yeah. and see myself as a failing person. I want to run away from that which is obviously unhealthy because, well, you can't improve. And also that probably means there's bigger problems in your life because you just identify with your results in poker too much. Yes. Yes. Whereas if you see everything that you do at the tables as a decision, it doesn't define you. It doesn't mean that 
just because you played that hand that way, it doesn't say anything about you. It might say something about you in that specific moment. If you were tilting, that's who you were that very moment. But that's worth analyzing as well. Why was I tilting? Yes. And more importantly, why did it keep why did I keep playing while I'm tilting? Why yes. didn't I take the break? Why didn't I step away? All these questions, right? So and I do see that as well. Like with the high stakes players, they're more ready to accept the truth and and look at it objectively without having that self talk of oh, I'm just a loser. Look at I just I completely butchered that play. I'm just I just suck. I don't deserve to be these stakes. I'm I'm just gonna lose all my money. And the spiral just that just goes uh, yeah. beyond that. Absolutely, this is some one of the things that I appreciated so much from a high stakes poker flans when I was ten and L, twenty five and L, back in two thousand and seven or eight or something, and they were playing highest stakes. And when I was tilting, I you know they go through my hands because they felt responsible. I was a little, mm -hmm. little kid walking around, and they were helping me to learn to play. And they would look to my hands, and they're like man, this is a lot of tilt. And I'm like, yeah, I was tilting. And they said, but still, let's let's just still look at it because, you know, we can still learn from this hand. And I was like, no, I was tilting. I don't have to look at it. It was tilt. No, no, but let, let me see the hand. Okay, you raise on a button with jack four. That's bad. That's a little bit loose, but let's look at the flop. <laughs> I'm like, why do you want to look at the flop? I, it was tilt. I'm like, no, let's look at the flop. Okay, you see bet on an ace-ace-deuce board. That's maybe a little bit, I don't know if you should do that. Maybe you should check. And they just go through the hand like a surgeon, like operating mm -hmm. super objectively. I'm like, but this 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 process hurts me, and I try to explain them. This hurts. It hurts me personally. I don't want to. I don't want this pain. I have tilted. I felt very embarrassed of doing the shit with the jack four. I shouldn't be there. I know I shouldn't be there. So what is there to learn? I was just emotional. I was just not in the right place. I wouldn't do this normally, basically. I, and he said, it, it doesn't really matter if you were tilting or not. Now it's a sample and we can study it and just look at it. And maybe you played the river, right? Who knows? Maybe you, maybe from the turn, you played it excellent. Who knows? We can just look at it. And, and that was such a great way for me of looking at it. It just blew my mind of how you can approach something like that. You know, positive mindset. You, Yeah, you definitely butchered that hand, but now it's a sample and now we can study it, right? Yeah, if you approach it correctly, yeah, definitely what a powerful tool. But as with everything, because, you know, I see very many people falling into a trap of studying something, especially now with the new tools. Well, I say new mm -hmm. tools, they, they're not new anymore. I mean, let's, let's face it, they've been around for... Too yeah. many years to call them new. But the old school's new. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the old school's new tools, right? And with that, they gain an outlet for putting the responsibility away from them. Mm -hmm. right? Because all of a sudden, you have a validation mechanism in a, like, really quickly checking the solver. The solver says, yeah, it's okay, I can mix there, so it's mm -hmm. fine. It's not fine. If you're looking for a dumb algorithm and a, a bunch of numbers to validate your decisions and your strategy and your understanding of how you're playing. Well, it helps you with your ego because all of a sudden, mm. well, you feel better about yourself. You don't need to worry too much about it, but it really could hurt your development because you're not going to progress as quickly as, as, as you could. Yes, And that that's a trap. And same trap as looking for the positives for example right because at the end of the day we just have to be a bit more honest with ourselves and just look at what we do and and be honest like okay i fucked up i have to admit it i have to and it's fine it's fine to make mistakes it's fine to fuck up in a bigger way it's it's fine to just have a horrible session and then the next day play very tired you shouldn't be playing it's fine. Don't beat yourself up too much about it. We all make mistakes and we repeat those mistakes. But be honest with yourself. Why am I doing this? Dig for the reasons. Because without that 
sort of interrogation, the internal interrogation, how are you ever going to improve? Because I think, and I didn't address that yet, but in my two plus two uh, thread, there was some discussion with uh, about the mental game and how unnecessary it is because it serves no value to becoming a better poker player. Mm. And I still didn't find time to address it because I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion because there's two ways to look at it. We can look at poker as purely a mathematical a game, right? Where there's a solution and all you need to do is just to make the right decision. That's it. That's poker. Or you can look at poker as part of your career and as part of your life. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, but just being the best genius in the world and making all the right decisions, but having a shitty life mm-hmm. where you burn yourself out, you have no health, no happiness, and nothing really matters, and you're just kind of depressed while sitting on your on your millions. I'm sorry, but that's that's the losing mentality in this case. Mm-hmm. That's not it, right? And and there, the mental game, the mindset, the diet, the sleep, all the things, everything that combines to it, how to be improving your life. That's that's what matters. That what's that's what matters more so than just being mechanical about it and finding the best ways to execute the solar strategies. Because in the process, if you go through 14, 16 hour days of just poker, 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 and you forget about the bigger game, because you're mm-hmm. not only playing poker, you're playing the game of life at the end of the day. And if if you neglect the game of life, well, it, that game is bigger and it's going to bite you in your ass whether yes. you like it or not. Yes. Hell yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, I, I, I always have empathy for, you know, when it comes to 2 plus 2 or YouTube comments or Twitter comments, um, especially when they are very black and white or when they are very direct, not unnuanced, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> not talking about trolls, but, you know, honest discussion, but that's not nuanced. Um, because I've been that person as well. And I think it comes from this scarcity mindset of not having anything. And it can be not having any money, not having any opportunity, not having any status, not having any girls, not having any friends. When you don't have something, then you really f- attach too much value to that one thing. And you think that one thing is going to do a lot more than what it actually is going to do. Whether it's money or attention from girls or a couple of rich, successful friends or status, people like you, 10,000 followers on Twitter, all of these things have a way, 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 way smaller impact than you expect them to be. Because I've been there. I've been zero followers, zero girls, zero money, homeless, depressed, and felt like a loser and zero successful friends. And now I have a bunch of rich businessmen friends and crypto guys and poker player guys. I'm talking with you. It's mind blowing to me. Sometimes I got to wake myself up when these opportunities happen. I got a couple of Twitter followers and I got a good chunk of money. I, I don't really feel that different to be fair. And I know it sounds crazy for a lot of people who have nothing now, but trust me, I've been there. It doesn't really feel that different. Yes, I have food, which is great. And I have a house which that's awesome. And I have a car to drive me around. But we humans are incredibly gifted in finding problems if we don't have them. And we'll create problems. We'll create things that we worry maybe even more about than I did about money and girls and food back in the day. Now, I mean, my anxiety connected to having a public company is tenfold the anxiety that I had of hunger or girls or i mean i have to take care of people now i have employees they count on me i have like connections with people that i'm trying to be a good person everybody like me that's just so much like oof. and what it all comes down to is that you cover all these assets if you just focused on improving your life right becoming a better person you don't have to do it one by one like hyper focusing on the money you can do both you can and make money and become a better person. You don't have to sit at home, grind 18 hours a day and do nothing. 
All right? Is that really all you want? Is that the only skill set you value? Because I'll, man, I'll promise you, if that's the only skill set you develop, that is not a guarantee that you're going to be successful in other areas of life as well. If you're not put in the same amount of hours, at least, and the same time and commitment in that other area. Right? I don't think a poker player is always more inclined to become a successful businessman or a successful investor or anything else successful if they choose just to jump into it without any experience. I think that skill set is that broad. It is deep, but it's not really super broad, right? It's a very narrow skill set, which is very valuable, but narrow nonetheless, right? It's not really... Um, like, for example, let's talk about a, a soccer player who learns soccer, plays soccer, uh, teamwork, so, socializing with the incredible big company and... Um, Dealing with an audience, a lot of times fame, managing their finances, signing contracts, dealing with managers, uh, sports physically, their top fit. When they come out of a football career, they have a pretty good perspective for themselves many times. Right? And if we look at a poker player coming out of a poker career, the perspective that they have is really connected to how much work did you put outside of poker? And not really how much work did you put in poker, right? Yeah, I, what I see from a lot of the people in the high stakes community, there's a certain feeling of, I have to double down right now mm -hmm. because once again, the same idea that I had and we all have at some point that, oh my God, this is not going to last forever, mm -hmm. right? So I have to do it now. Would couple that with an idea of I'm going to make an X amount sometime soon. So I pretty much can retire and then I'm going to do whatever else. Mm -hmm. And couple that with um, a belief in yourself on a scale that, well, you know what? I cracked this high stakes poker thing. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to figure things out in other areas as well. And that's one way to approach it, right? And I don't know if it's necessarily bad for everybody, like if it's universally bad, perhaps some people can actually pull it off and it's the I'm best sure decision they, they're making. And it, for some, it definitely is the best decision and, and, and the best way to approach things. And then there are others who approach it in a, okay, I'm not going to obsess about the high stakes games and I'm going to try to use my time to actually investigate other areas mm. of my life and I'm going to explore other interests, right? For, for example, myself, right? I thought, well, this podcasting thing is an interesting idea. I like to do it. So how about I just put more and more and more and more time into it, right? Financially, the probably the stupidest decision that I've ever made, right? Because this, this is just crazy. But what, how do we measure whether it's good? And if we take objective measures and say, okay, so what was the cost on your poker career, specifically the cost of not being present there? Yes. And if we just count it, I mean, it's not even close. So you always have to be sure about the metric that you're using, right? Yes. And Again, with the metric, whenever, you know, you've mentioned Twitch, for example, and a lot of people now see it as a way to diversify their poker interest. Okay, mm. they are okay poker player, but they are good communicators. They're going to be able to succeed in Twitch. But with that comes another problem of whenever you're exposing your work publicly, all of a sudden, you have this surface area where people can just attack you big mm. time, right? And you can yeah. put your heart into something like, oh, I'm going to gonna make this Twitch stream. I'm just going to put my best face on. I'm just going to absolutely crush the games and explain every decision. And you're going to get a lot of shit thrown your way and you have to deal with it. And it's yeah, part of the game and it's not hard to deal with it, but that's part of the reality. So... Every yeah. decision, every 
direction that we take our life has its own problems. And as you described, when you are in a position of wealth and abundance, or when you're in a position where you're actually struggling to make the ends meet, deep down, you're the same person. And deep down, the problems are roughly the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You'll find them if you're looking for them. And we're always looking for them because of our expectations of ourselves, right? We want more, 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 more. And that causes all this friction and inner conflict. Um, I mean, if you look at poker, you'll see that most of the successful players, such as yourself, are diversifying their skill set. They're not hyper-focused on just poker, but they got a business, building community, offering tons of value, YouTube videos or podcasts. They're doing something to expand their skill set because they understand that that's the game. Really, that is the game. Poker in itself, on its own, that's really not going to make you happy long term if that's your only focus in life. You're going to have to expand your skill set just for the fact because it's fun and it's enjoyable to step away and do something like this. Hey, maybe you start missing poker for a couple of days. Great. That feeling, I mean, oh, pff, probably haven't felt that in a decade. Now you miss it. You want to get back into it. Yes, let's get back into it. I'm excited, right? Isn't that a great feeling? It can mm. feed each other, right? And if I, if, if, for example, now, right now, you know, you look at all these great athletes as well, whether it's Conor McGregor or Ronaldo or Rafael Nadal or all these guys, they have not only dedicated their entire life to the sport, but they've also diversified the amounts of things that they're doing. Whether it's Ronaldo, who's a god on social media. And I mean, you can't tell me that's just because of his soccer skills. My, my, I mean, my mother-in-law has no idea how good of a soccer player he is, but he knows who he is. So he's definitely at least interested in social media and he sees the value of social media, right? Probably has a good team around him, but also is interested in what it can do for him and how he can learn and improve in that aspect or whether it's his business ventures or his documentaries or his book or his brands or his investments or... This always, the, 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 the elite is always diversifying because it's interesting to them. They're curious by nature and they're competitive by nature and they're always looking for more things to do. I think the challenge there is to still, within that process of having all these things going for you, still find that moment of peace for yourself, right? Because, for example, I'm working very closely with Ratio Edge and Ben CB. Great example of this. As a company, has uh, Razor Edge has esports. Razor Edge has you know a great poker career, shipping tournaments all the time. Has tons of free content on YouTube, putting it out consistently. I think everything with him is feeding each other in a way. Mm -hmm. It's making him better in all of these things simultaneously. It's not making him worse. The attention that going away from poker and putting in his company or YouTube is not making him a worse poker player. I think it's even making him a better poker player by living a more happy and balanced and stable life. But I do agree. I do have to give like, I do have to give the cynical two plus two guys. I'll, I'll give them this. It's very hard to get to that place. Once you haven't defined where you want to go yet, extremely hard. If you're playing 10 and L 50 and L it is very tricky to get to that mental space because man, you got 1200 on a bankroll you can't really make a living off it yet you've not really feeling super confident you don't have a real structure in place yet you feel like you haven't scratched the surface of understanding poker theory then yeah i understand you have different priorities and your mind is you know uh, occupied with different priorities right now than professionals are but i do recommend getting to that place as quick as possible really because I do believe there's some 10 and L grinders out there who got that figured out, right? They might not be winning high stakes plays, but they got it figured out, really. Tell me a bit more about the intellectual giftedness, right? The topic that we started with, and I just want to get back to it and, and perhaps hear some of your examples of some of the things that people 
struggle with, people don't recognize maybe some of the common things that you see working mm -hmm. with this group of people? Well, highly intelligent people are also, almost all of them are also highly sensitive. Now, highly sensitive people don't have to be highly intelligent, but highly intelligent people are pretty much always highly sensitive, meaning that they have a higher awareness in life of everything. The concept hyper body, hyper brain, right? The brain is always going. Elon Musk described this very, very beautifully in the Joe Rogan podcast, where Joe Rogan just asked him nonstop, bro, how do you do all these things? That There's so much. You going to Mars and building electric car. And he said, my, my brain is just going all the time and it's not really a nice place to be in. Like mm -hmm. it's just going nonstop explosions. It's, it doesn't stop. I can't turn it off. And that's really a huge giveaway from high intelligence. If you actually have a brain that has a life on its own and you feel sometimes that it's spiraling out of control with overthinking certain situations, jumping into rabbit hole to rabbit hole, jumping into Wikipedia page and Wikipedia page and YouTube to YouTube and having your focus jump all over the place isn't trait from ADD. And ADD is one of the most misdiagnosed diagnosis when it comes to high intelligence because it's so similar. Mm -hmm. um, if we know ADD, we know what it is, right? This annoying kid that's always messing up the class and, and talking a lot and being a clown, etc and not being able to focus long periods on the schoolwork. Uh, but the minor differences there is that a gifted kids is not focusing because they can't focus, but they're not focusing because they don't see a practical application in their life, or it's not aligned with their values and their beliefs, which mm -hmm. as a young kid is tricky. Like what are your values and your beliefs, right? But as a young kid, if they are already wondering about values and beliefs, we have a clear giveaway that this kid is potentially more intelligent than average. And we need to look at Maslow's pyramid as well, where we talk about shelter, safety, food, love, relationships. And then at the top, we look at self-actualization. Who am I? And what do I want to do? What is my impact? And we notice with highly intelligent people that that pyramid is upside down. At a very young age, they're not worrying about who am I, uh, uh, worrying about safety and shelter and relationships. They're worrying about who am I? What am I going to do? And because they deal with these complicated questions at an age where they don't have the life experience to answer them, depression, anxiety, complete collapsing, burnouts in, in, in elementary school, high school, kids burning out. It's insane. And that's because they're asking themselves way too complicated questions and they're not getting the right guidance to develop themselves. Right Now, when it comes to high intelligence and high sensitivity, it's very, very common signs, right? We're talking about having a good idea of people being able to scope people out, uh, experiencing movies and arts and songs deeply, like something means so much to you and then you give it to somebody else, they're like, okay, <laughs> right? That feeling. Um, deep, deep, deep empathy, sometimes such a deep level of empathy that you carry other people's problems with you for extended periods of time. And some things in conflicts with other people sit with you longer than it does with other people. Right. And then you have high, high compassionate level, great listeners, oftentimes, if they're interested. And if they're not, they're just floating, daydreaming away while you're talking and they're nodding. And right? then you also have the kid that is in class, disturbing the class, not paying attention. That's the ADD. But if you have a kid that is in class, disturbing the class, not paying attention, and he is aware of everything and can repeat word for word, what the teacher just said, then there's a big chance we got a highly intelligent kid. And there was a lot of minor differences. That's why the, the challenge there is, when is it ADD and when is it high intelligence? Because they're super similar. And I got diagnosed for ADD and they gave me ADD medication and didn't do anything at all. Eventually finding out later on in life, well, yeah, okay, maybe it's not ADD. But also when it comes to drugs, right? Drugs, high sensitivity, high intelligence, People are, and this, you know, this is tricky because I have these general generalizations is black and white. And that's because there's not a lot of good, solid research on high intelligence. Main reason is, is 
first of all, we don't really understand the brain that well. And second of all, it's not just the brain, it's actually a body type. It's your whole body is wired differently, like we spoke about earlier, right? Uh, asthma, uh, autoimmune diseases, allergies, those things occur more often with highly intelligent people than uh, non-highly intelligent people. So the stereotype is kind of true, right? So um, looking at that, it's tricky to have a good sense of good sample size of people as a control group to do these researches, scientific researches. A lot of it is, a lot of it is anecdotal. And I think that's why we shouldn't approach it as a science anyway, because if we only have 5% of the world who is highly intelligent, IQ is moving up all around the world. So we need to either adjust the IQ test or we need to just call a lot of people highly intelligent, maybe 10, 15% of the world is highly intelligent, who knows? Maybe our idea of intelligence is incorrect and it's not just academically, but we also have fighting intelligence, a puzzle intelligence, mental game intelligence, art, music, um, nature, right? Uh, animals, I mean, who do you, how do you call people who are so deeply connected with wild animals and just fight and wrestle with a bear and a lion? They're not stupid either, right? So there's so many different types of intelligence that are all connected basically with being overly sensitive to something, right? And now we also have the little bit of the autism part, right? When things in your surrounding changes, whew, that's rough. Minor changes in your life or changes in structure seem to collapse everything around you instead of, oh, okay, tomorrow I'm going to wake up 10 minutes later for a highly sensitive, highly intelligent person. That means 10 minutes becomes 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And, you know, next, no, next thing we know, we're waking up at 6 p.m. So there's a lot of clear giveaways, but I think overall it is definitely uh, overly sensitive to things with all the consequences that comes with it. And some of them have a great social skill set and can deal with big social events. Most of them have a little bit of tricky time with big overwhelming social events where there's a lot of unknown people, right? And perfectionism as well. Some of them have it very deeply. Some of them have a little bit less of it. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a, a decent outline, I think. Mm. Some good giveaways. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's talk about the score keeping the score, especially the external score. Because when you were talking, let's say, about the people who are highly intelligent with the way they interact with animals, let's put it this way, right? Mm -hmm. In a modern world, we are very often dismissing a lot of these careers, a lot of uh, these endeavors as, oh, yeah, well, that's just, yeah, that's just silly. The intelligent people are out there, lawyers, the bankers, the politicians, the whatnot. You know, whoever, whatever your background is, you have your own set of um, career choices that you regard as, oh, these are where the intelligent options are, where the intelligent mm -hmm. people go. And by the way, the, the the lawyers, bankers, and the politicians is not my top three, in case you're wondering. So. <laughs> but um, that's a bit of a problem, right? Because we would dismiss a lot of careers, a lot of, um, well, basically a lot of people, we would dismiss them Yes. Uh, just because of some silly notion of a metric. Yes. What yeah. about the internal scorecard? Because mm. mm. one thing, obviously, is somebody else is telling you, well, what you do doesn't matter. What you do is irrelevant. And you, know, you anyway, you're stupid. Well, fine. It's like the big Lebowski said, like, cool. It's just your opinion, dude. Right. Mm -hmm. But for yourself, if you have that self-talk yourself, that's when it becomes scary. When, yes. when you think yourself like, okay, well, I'm dealing with animals and happen to be pretty good at that, but yes. it doesn't matter. It's a shit job. It's a stupid endeavor. Yeah, I enjoy it, but I'm probably an idiot wasting away my life. Mm. Right? And it's a tough spot to, to have to deal with. And People in all sorts of professions always have to deal. It doesn't even have any correlation with profession. You always have to deal with self-talk. And oftentimes the self-talk is negative. And poker players, likewise, you know, we're very keen to be critical, self-critical, and um, mm. give a lot of shit to ourselves. Do you have any ideas on that topic? 
Well, first of all, we have to accept the fact that the IQ score or the other people's perspective of us, uh, that's just what it is. It's this empty metric that we've created, like paper money or money in itself. It's just an empty metric that doesn't mean anything as long as we don't give it any meaning. And if we give it meaning, now all of a sudden it means everything. So the IQ score as well, if we chose, choose to give it any meaning, now it means a lot. And if we don't, then it really means nothing because I know people with below average who are millionaires and people with way over average, 160, 165, I've counseled them in the past and they're still nowhere, right? They call them lazy, gifted kids. I think lazy, burnt out, gifted kids or something. I don't know. This couple of articles and YouTube videos on that, which, which is a thing, right? Lazy, gifted kids. I don't call them lazy. Usually they're afraid, but these gifted kids go to a huge span of, wow, how am I going to make sense of all of this? All of the things that I've heard from other people and the things that I now am telling myself and I'm believing about myself. Is this true? Is this not true? It's tricky. It's incredibly tricky. And I think a good place to start is journaling, really, with this as well. Mm -hmm. Journaling is super powerful because now we can start to differentiate between what am I hearing exactly? Am I actually hearing self-talk or is it just a feeling? I'm really a person who doesn't have a lot of self-talk, but I have an, an emotional dialogue with myself almost. I feel sensations and I can um, feel the exact same sensations that I felt when I was younger in a specific scenario. Sometimes I can't even remember them properly. Maybe I'm pretty deeply traumatized or whatever, but I feel the exact sensation that I felt in that moment. And that's almost like a, emotional reliving of certain events. And that for me as well is like self-talk. I need to pull myself out of that narrative that I'm creating, that emotional negative spiral and put myself back into a positive upswing. But how do you do that if you don't know where the emotions are coming from? And if you're not aware of what is triggering that, uh, because self-talk is always triggered by something. The dialogue starts somewhere, whether it's external or internal, Somebody somewhere, they initiated the dialogue and it started and it went to go off its own. But we need to find these triggers for what they are. For me, caffeine, big one. If I'm loaded on caffeine, my mind races a little bit faster than usual. And I get into overthinking a little bit easier than if I don't. Now, that's me. Other people, it might silence them. Perfect. But I think everybody has different triggers, physical, but also mental, emotional. I know my response to loneliness also is self-talk. If I haven't checked in with my wife a long period of time or haven't checked in with my friends, been very selfish, been working very hard, I get very negative self-talk. My phone, spend a lot of time on my phone. Man, I just, I listen, this TikTok, it's the devil. TikTok is a devil. TikTok knows me better than I know myself. It's the devil. And I notice, sometimes I catch myself. I'm scrolling through TikTok, looking at fat asses. I'm like, Whoa, stop it, man. What you doing? You're a guy, 30-year-old guy. What you looking at these girls? What's this? this? But this it sucks you in. It's incredibly powerful. And it's created by, you know, all these behavior scientists, these PhD professionals. They know exactly how your brain works. They can pull you in and keep you there. And then that TikTok app tells me, ah, okay, triggers. Why am I in this app? Why am I disconnecting? I probably should check on my wife, my friends. Have I ate something that messed me up? Have I experienced something disappointing? Am I worrying about money maybe? I'm worrying about something because this is a very clear trigger for me, right? The TikTok, the cell phone, the video games as well for me. I bought a Nintendo Switch, love to play with my fiance. That's my rule in the house. When we play, we play socially. And when I play on my own for like two hours, I know, okay, there's something I need to work on, right? And I've only learned this because, you know, I've written about it physically just put it on paper to recognize those triggers yeah journaling definitely a powerful powerful thing yeah. it doesn't have and, to be on paper right you can do mm. vi video auto audio like whatever just get it out of your system mm -hmm. yeah get it out of the system as if somebody would read it nobody yes. needs to read it because yeah. the same thing happens when you're coaching people whatever the topic, right? I, I coach people on the topic of Patlim Ramaha. Mm -hmm. I learn 
in every session that I do with them, I learn almost as much as they do, or perhaps sometimes more, because it forces me to revisit some of the ideas. It forces me to crystallize, put things on paper. When they ask questions, I'm always happy because it, well, you know what, especially if it's a question I haven't thought about before because, hey, now I have to look at it from uh, this perspective. Most of the time, the answer is right there somewhere and I, at, on some level, know the answer immediately. But to have it said out loud and to have it sort of pinpointed, it solidifies the ideas and mm. eventually ideas connect to other ideas and that's how it snowballs. Yes. And definitely. for that, like any way you can talk to even friends, it doesn't have to be a student coach relationship, just, mm -hmm. you know, finding somebody where you can discuss things, whether it's about your career or about your life. And probably there has never been a more important time to do so than right now amid the mm -hmm. pandemic, because we are neglecting the social contact we are forced to neglect the social contact in a way. And yeah. for some people, this sort of Zoom call, WhatsApp call communication is not the same thing. No. I know no, it's not the either. same thing for me. I don't really want to have deep discussions with people on uh, WhatsApp. Me neither. When it comes to having a podcast, that's that's my escape and actually having a deep discussion because yeah. that's a setting, a time and a place. But with the family, it feels awkward. Like I don't, I, and I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way that you know it's it's not the same thing as the real thing. Mm -hmm. But it's important to find uh, ways to, well, to sort of journal out loud with with other people in a way because especially recently i see more and more of the people i know struggling uh with mental health issues yes. with depression with just losing the sense of purpose and realizing that you know this thing that i've been doing because it paid the bills in the in the bars and the nightclubs and paid for the travel well now that the bars and the travel is taken away from me what is the point and hmm. Mama, know, a lot of people scared. have to reconsider uh exactly what are they doing and why yeah me too man me too a lot of my well almost all of my friends are in asia right now they uh got you know basically stuck there they're working there but they're also stuck there so we can't meet each other i can't go there they really can't go back here so yeah i had that dream as well because you know i grew up around high stakes poker players and i saw their life it was a huge motivator for me to be able to have access to that kind of freedom and life and and, and luxury and then i started my company to two years ago sometime and i started to get some momentum and build some steam and then the pandemic hits and now I got all this money and freedom and a beautiful company, but I can't travel and I can't experience the Asia lifestyle, which I want to. So mm -hmm. a big chunk of my motivation just got taken away from me. And a big chunk of my rewards got taken away from me. And then I really had to learn to be at peace with actually putting in the work, that the process of putting in the work should be the main satisfaction in my life and not the rewards. The rewards are cool and they'll come and, you know, I'll probably have plenty, plenty access to them later in the future once this whole thing is over. But for now, I'm going to have to be at peace with my work. I'm going to be happy and content and satisfied with what I'm doing or else I'm going to lose my mind. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's tricky. It's very tricky for me as well as a coach. I'm not putting myself above anybody else. It's a very difficult times, very difficult. Uh, especially, I mean, if you live in certain countries with strict rules, we're pretty strict now. We got a lockdown and everything's closed except grocery stores and we uh, have a curfew at 9 p.m. or 8 p.m. So it's pretty strict and it's pretty isolated. But at the same time, if you're happy with the work you're doing, you know, besides just work, but also self-improvement work, weightlifting, trying to get ripped, going to get a shredded life coach look, that we be cool. And, you know, mm -hmm. trying to be more structured and disciplined with the things that I'm already doing, dive more deeper in my triggers and recognize them once they surface. Um, 
watch my diet a little bit more because, you know, pandemic lockdowns, easy to let go of that healthy diet sometimes. So there's definitely things that I still get enjoyment from. Although, yeah, it's fine to say I'm struggling, man. I'm really struggling. That's fine. I am. Mm. I'm struggling. I miss my friends. I miss good Asian food. I miss live poker. I miss all that stuff. Mm. It's fine. I think it's fine to be struggling. Oh, it absolutely is. And, um, it's important to know that it's fine to be open about struggling because uh, I think a lot of people get into the depressive state of mind, which could have been prevented by just letting it out sooner. Mm-hmm. Because they're, you know, people are open to helping you and discussing things, and sometimes all you might need is just an outlet for for yeah. some of the problems that build out. And uh, I agree. But You've mentioned that the lifestyle of a high-stakes poker player really appealed to you, and that was something you wanted to do. What exactly about the high-stakes poker player idea appealed to you? Early on, it was obviously money. Uh, That was cool, being able to make seemingly easy money. And I think that was kind of true back in 2006, 7, 8, Uh, It was not very difficult to get a decent win rate. Now, when we're going to get beyond that, I think it potentially was maybe a bit more difficult than now because of the lack of study materials and knowledge that was out there. I would say the elite back then was really elite. There was like four people or five people or something on Betfair who was sitting at the 10K and L something like Billy Wonka or someone or Monkey, some the guys were just waiting on on people and they were, uh, yeah, they really haven't had the opportunity for a lot of big volume. So I think it was pretty difficult to get to that level. But up until a certain level, it was quite easy and manageable. So the money was first. But then I noticed that there was something that I respected as an identity that they had, the the personality that came with it, the ability to commit to something when everybody else tells you this is stupid. You're going to gamble. Why are you going to gamble? There's so many things that you can do in life, but you still you still want to do this. And you can say with full conviction, yes, I know this path in front of me is not going to be easy. But yes, I'm going to commit to this. And I know it's no stability. And I know it doesn't give me any security or retirement or benefits or health insurance. But yes, I'm still going to commit this purely off of the belief in myself and the confidence that I have that I can do this. And I can not only do this reasonably successful, but I can do this and become one of the best at it. That attitude that I saw with high stakes players was just mind blowing. Like it changed my perspective of of life. Like how can you have that? That's delusional. That's really what I thought. And to be able to be so delusional and so confident is just, yeah, I really attracted to that idea, to that concept that they were just actually, you know, the, 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 the statistics back then. And now I think, they're not so different, right? It's still the same percentage of people who became super successful. And it's just mind blowing to me. How how are you betting on like a three or four or 5% chance that you're gonna be among that group of people? That's just incredible. And it gave me a sort of belief in myself. It rubbed off on me and I never got rid of it ever since because I got the same questions and the same cynicism when I started my coaching company when they said, you know what, life coaching is kind of, people are kind of, you know, mindset and it's kind of scammy and and it kind of has that attitude or the energy around it is, you know, a lot of people are very skeptical towards it. And then you're not only going to go mindset, but you're going to go intellectually gifted. Like what? That's a very small niche, bro. Like I know, but I don't know. I just believe in myself. And I really attribute that to being around guys who yeah, just had no support around them whatsoever, but still just did it. That was incredible. I think it's just, you know, definitely at the at the top three like <laughs> jobs of parents that 
would rather not have their kids do professional gambler, oh, yeah. <laughs> drug dealer, <laughs> but bank robber. I don't know. Right. I mean, if, if I get kids, I would definitely have a, a good, good talk with them about it. I mean, mm. it wouldn't be no immediately, but we'd, we'd have to sit down and talk. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. Uh, if my son would say, Hey, Papa, I'm gonna, gonna play poker for a living. It's kind of hard to say, no, son, (laughs) I know it paid for your education and such, but I don't advise you go the same way. But um, yeah, it's definitely not the parents' dreams to have have that conversation when when your kid comes over and says, "Uh, you know what, forget about all that conventional career stuff. I'm just going to do this and uh, Mm. it's fine. It's not gambling, I I promise, (laughs) right? How, how did you do it though? How did you, and I mean, did you start with Pot Limit Omar? Uh, no, I transitioned after a few years. I okay. um, I was playing Hold'em at mid to high stakes. Can be probably considered high stakes. Like I was playing up to 2K uh, Hold'em yeah. back in the day. And then, yeah, some 10 years ago, I just decided to transition to PLO. And I, I had to have a discussion with my friends, the poker friends, who all thought that I'm crazy because they're like, what are you doing? You're you're doing so great in this No Limit Hold'em thing and you're going to drop it all and just focus on this game. Nobody even plays this game. This game has no future. I was just like, well, but I like it. It's fun. It have four cards. It's more interesting and it's a different intellectual pursuit because the way you have to look at the game, the game tree, it's different. Options are very different. It's kind of same, same, but different in, in a way. Mm-hmm. Much, much. Because, you know, if somebody would tell, ask me which one is a more interesting game, it's absolutely individual. To mm. me, PLO just appeals so much. But I used to love Hold'em. Um, now I don't care about it that much. Mm. Occasionally I could play it, but um, it's not my thing anymore. So yeah, I just transitioned naturally sort of. And and how did you lead. deal with that? Because you had to deal with it twice, like the doubt and the people are questioning your, your choices. First, you want to play poker and then you want to play this niche game within poker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the uh, to be honest, I didn't care much about other people's opinions. I guess that's what it boiled down to, that's right? Because because all the discussions we had with friends were not really discussions. It was they they would voice their opinions about what I'm doing, and I would say, well, that's all interesting, but I'm doing it anyway. So what what do you want from me? You can join me if you want. We can study together. And there were no takers. But um, yeah. The loss. Well, I don't know. Because I, I think it's, you know, if, if you believe that No Limit Hold'em is the best game and you've tried PLO and it doesn't appeal to you, by all means, stick to it. Because yeah. A lot of people just jump games for the sole reason, oh, there's going to be more money in PLO. Look, PLO is booming. There's just more recreational players. It's just better, better, better on so many levels. If that's your motivation, maybe consider not doing it because mm-hmm. if you try the game and you say, oh, wow, this is awesome. I really like the idea of getting deep into it and investigating it and cracking it. This idea appeals to me. And on top of that, there's all the potential, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Yeah. Please, please go ahead. Right? Because the potential, whenever we look at potential of a specific game in that time frame, wherever we're looking at, it doesn't mean the potential is going to be there forever. No. There might be a, a different game around the corner. So just do what you enjoy most and then that's what matters more because even in terms of potential, I mean, there's still plenty of great games in No Limit Hold'em. Yeah. Occasionally, there's more lucrative action in the No Limit Hold'em uh, um, niche. Occasionally, there's way more lucrative action in, in PLO. Right? And I'm talking about the, the high stakes because honestly, if you're playing mid stakes and low stakes, you shouldn't even think in those terms because there is action, there is enough action. You you don't care 
when you are at the high stakes level, when actually there could be a period that, hey, for a month, there was no game, mm. even though that almost never happens still, but you know, you never know, these things can happen. And even in the live series, you sometimes go to a, to a place where you expect live action and no, nobody wants to play your game. Nobody wants to play Hold'em or nobody wants to play PLO. That, that can happen. I still like PLO, like I've started to learn it this year mm-hmm. and I really love it for, as a recreational, because, you know, I haven't been really deeply committed to poker for a very long time, but as a recreational, I just love it. It's instant, it's action packed, a lot of hands, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of possibilities, crazy things happen. You're never super far behind. You, you, in a way, you also never feel outplayed. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I'm probably getting destroyed, but I don't feel like it because there's always a way out for me. I can like get yeah. some equity somewhere and just crush this wreck. And it just feels very, yeah, very <laughs> satisfying to like hit some crazy hand on a wreck and mm. get paid off. And especially live is just perfect. I've played it once live. And I just noticed, wow, this is the perfect life game. Everybody's playing every single hand, big pots, it's madness, it's casual, it's fun. People are kind of used to bad beats, so they're not really yelling and screaming and cursing. And true, like yeah. set over set, it's like, okay, whatever, set over set. It's like, yeah, so it's a, a little bit more chill vibe, in my opinion. Mm. No, the live PLO games are definitely way more fun. And for quite a long time, they, they've they been dominating in the, in the high stakes world. I mean, there is obviously still a, a bunch of private action and hold them. But casinos, if you look at the, the casinos, the high stakes are usually going to be, well, mixed games, to be honest. But, you know, if there is going to be a high stakes game, which is not part of a mix, it's, it's a PLO. But what you were saying about the feeling is that you're not getting that crushed. That is a beautiful part about PLO. And yet it also is a very, very dangerous part of PLO. And not only that, not only the fact that without knowledge about the game, without deep knowledge of the game, you would get that feeling. But also we talked earlier about how some of the tools and how some of the information that you might be getting about the game can mislead you and the false sense of security, a false sense of knowledge. You know, you would study some sort of a couple charts and um, a little description of something, play around with a solver, and you would get a sense of like, oh, I got this. In Hold'em, because everything is much easier to visualize and everything is much easier to double check, you're actually going to fool yourself less often than in Mm. PLO. And whereas in PLO, you can always just get the illusion that you understand what's going on Mm. and leave it at that without investigating further. Because like, nah, I've studied post-flop spot. I've studied single race spot, button against big blind. I've got this, right? And you leave it at that and you just don't realize that you're... Because another thing is which we didn't even talk much about today is the variance, mm. right? And I think Crazy. Yet one thing that the high stakes players, I think universally are better at grasping and understanding compared to the lower stakes players is just how much variance there is in all the games that we play and how yeah. huge the effect is, right? Because whenever... and all these challenges like the poke against Negrano, the Galfon challenges, the multiple ones that they had, that they um, Galfon played. Whenever high stakes players were talking about the challenges, they were always like, well, 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 listen, this is a small sample. Anything can happen. Don't, don't, you know, hold, hold your horses. This is just, you know, not a big sample, a lot of variance there. And, a lot of people with less experience in the game were too quick to jump to conclusions of like, oh, yeah, this, this player is crushing and then this player is crushing and all the mm-hmm. narrative, forgetting that the underlying um, thing in all of that equation is variance and it's just yeah. huge. And the variance in PLO is obviously significantly higher than in Hold'em. Mm-hmm. Couple that with... 
slightly more difficult to comprehend information, the theory information about the game. And you can just fool yourself into thinking you're, you've got this. You're yeah. a good player. And you're in control. If you don't have a mechanism to double check that, to step back and let somebody look at your game, to be objective with yourself, it's too easy to fall into a trap of putting a label on yourself. I'm a mid-stakes player now. I reached mid-stakes in three months' time, just completely crushed it, and now I'm mid-stakes guy. And okay, never mind that my graph is downsloping all the time. It's just variance. Mm. And it's like, dude, so you got here, the variance wasn't part of it, and now you're losing here, and now the variance is like, how, how do you, what, what's going on there? was the contradiction right mm. problem is a crazy though i love the game it's crazy but that's yeah. that's yeah that's mostly why i love it i think it's a perfect recreational game but I, yeah i think for that reason it has a lot of traps definitely has a lot of traps yeah, yeah. i actually feel like some hands i'm playing well <laughs> <laughs> and I had no idea what I'm doing. I'm like, oh, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty good. <laughs> it's just, I'm hitting flops. It's nice. The runouts are good. I'm like, wow. And then I just all of a sudden think of bluffing. Oh, okay, I'll bluff. And it works. And I'm like, wow, nice. Mm. Just, yeah, it's it's dangerous. Really tricky, I can imagine. Because there's so many, it has so many traps indeed. Yeah. But it's beautiful, man. I hope more people are going to continue to play it. It's, uh, it's a great game. Well, I do hope that more people will get into PLO as well because it is a great game and uh, yeah it's uh, I hope I hope people jump in on it but definitely it was the case for the live games online definitely as well it's doing pretty well still to this day and also like considering how many huge advancements in, in technology we have in, in terms of solving No Limit Hold'em. The future for PLO seems a bit safer there. Mm -hmm. So yet another thing to, to think about. But anyway, listen, I want to thank you for your time. It was very interesting conversation and uh, I really enjoyed the scope of what we covered. We, we discussed so many things and I'm sure everybody's going to find their own uh, parts that resonated with them and and gave him some ideas. I know I definitely got some ideas and uh, you know full full page of notes that I took awesome. of things to look further into. Um, Happy to hear that. Is there anything else you want to leave the audience with today? Well, I just want everybody to not follow the news that much, not be too much on Twitter, too much on Facebook. Just try to stay healthy, commit to some good positive habits, experiment a little bit with the habits that you have, switch up some things, quit coffee for a couple of weeks, maybe wake up a little bit earlier, try some cold showers, take this time now that you're stuck in a house and, you know, do something with it. You know, make your make your pandemic productive. And I think there's a lot of people now winning during the pandemic and you can really be one of them. If you choose to disconnect from all the madness that's going on in politics and vaccine talk and all that stuff, just let those things play out. They're going to play out regardless if you read them or not read them. That's not the game you should be playing. Mm -hmm. Play your own game, right? Focus on your own game. And I mean, if everybody needs any help with that, as I say, I'm always offering 30 minute free sessions with everybody that wants it. I'm not going to refuse anybody. And if anybody wants to talk poker, talk pot limonoma, talk anything intelligence sensitivity even if you feel like well i recognize all of this but I'm, i don't think i'm highly intelligent well let's talk let's see right i mean i'm not gonna iq test you but we can talk and see if you recognize some things and maybe you'll get some insights right and i think it's uh, always good to have conversations with people so that's why i always do that and i'm obviously on all social medias at coach bomb and you can follow me anywhere you want and i'm happy i was here man yeah this absolutely. is indeed the podcast for smart people. <laughs> podcast for smart people. We should put it somewhere, somewhere yeah. in, the, in the footnotes or whatever. But yeah, it's <laughs> very, very, kind of very kind yeah. of you. Very kind of you. And uh, I'll definitely put the link or links rather to all of the stuff uh, where people can find you. And um, 
I also highly recommend people to go out and grab the opportunity of a 30 minute talk with you. Uh, because let's face it, it won't hurt you. Mm -mm. And by you, I mean the listener, it won't hurt you and it's only going to benefit you. And, uh, I just wonder if you ever had an inkling to say to somebody, oh, you know what? But you're actually not that intelligent because you mentioned that part. And I just was laughing internally thinking like, wouldn't that be a wonderful conversation? Somebody uh, approaches, coach, I want to talk to you. Do you know what? I've We've talked enough. <laughs> I think there's no potential here for you. You need to talk to somebody else. Pretty sure this is not ever going to happen. So... Hopefully um, not. <laughs> yeah, because if somebody is smart enough to use the opportunity to to grab those thirty minutes free with you, because not many people do the thirty minutes free, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you're not gonna do it forever as well. So mm -hmm. anybody listening, try try your luck now, because you know I started when I started doing um, everything that I'm doing with the podcast and the coaching. I was also very open to. Guys, you know, yes, my time, I'm available. And now I'm like, I, I still want to be available, but I also want to live. I don't, I, I can't, you know. It's so difficult. the fact that you're offering the 30 minutes to anybody who's going to ask is just incredible. And um, everybody should jump on it and, and use the opportunity. Anyway, Bahman, Bahman, Thank is you. that correct? That was it. That's nice. Right? Yeah. Because, uh, as you said, some people know you as Coach Banam. Something like no, ba Baman. Coach yeah. Baman. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So imagine I didn't butcher your, your real name, but I, I butchered the pronunciation that most people have. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but here we are. Anyway, it was once again, what a pleasure. Uh, thanks for connecting with me and uh, thank you for your, for your time today. And... Um, Everybody go on and apply for the 30 minutes. Thanks a lot, man. Likewise, I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Check out the description. And of course, I'd highly appreciate if you subscribe, click like, spread the word about the podcast. Also, if you'd like to receive a regular newsletter with my key takeaways about each episode, go ahead and subscribe to it on runchexpodcast.com. That's R-U-N-C-H-U-K-S podcast.com. I write those myself. I take it seriously and I really enjoy the interaction with the readers. So I hope you'll sign up uh, and I'll be back for you next time. Thank you.